Welcome to Raging Bullets, a DC Comics fan podcast, episode 426, the Raging Oscars 2015 nine-year anniversary show. Welcome to Raging Bullets. I'm Sean Whelan, Dr. Norge, and I'm joined as always by my co-host Jim. I hope I can start singing soon because you can't handle the tune. So says the sensei of the whatnot, Segulin, <laughs> and the Duke of You Know. How's it going, hey? <laughs> Jim, you're still recovering, as uh, unfortunately people are hearing right now, from uh, your previous sickness. But I really appreciate you being here today because... Uh, Jim and I just got done recording an almost three-hour Raging Oscars episode, and it's very concept-based, and if you're interested in seeing what those categories and concepts are before listening to the show, it's actually in the show notes. You can actually see the categories that we broke down, so you can follow along with us on this one, and we explained it a little bit more in detail at the start of the episode, but we're excited for you to join us as we end off this year right before Convergence with kind of our closing thoughts on everything before Convergence in this special Raging Oscars uh, episode. We are proud members of the Comics Podcast Network, the League of Comic Book Podcasts, and the InfiniteComics.com Podcast Partnership. I want to do a special shout out uh, this episode in our ad to DCBService.com and InStockTrades.com. You've heard us shout them out on many episodes over the last nine years as being a show sponsor, and they stuck with us where we were a very small podcast, uh, straight on through to what we are now. Such great people there. I used them as a customer before we had them as a sponsor on the show. They became a sponsor of our show, and it was a really organic thing. It was nice to be able to have the company that we're already enjoying and using reach out to us and uh, say hey look we'd like to sponsor your podcast and they've stuck with us consistently and i really appreciate it so i just wanted to shout them out and uh, just say you know if, if you're a listener and you haven't checked them out they support a wide variety of comic podcasts because they believe in the medium and i just want to thank them for continuing to sponsor our show and having been there with us for a good portion of the last nine years of the podcast James, what kind of a podcast are we? It's Raging Oscars time! And as always, please remember Raging Bullets is a spoiler podcast. We go in-depth into plot lines, story twists, and whatnot for the various stories throughout the entire DC universe. So please be wary and be warned, as the last thing we want to do is ruin your comic book reading experience. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. And actually, just a quick little heads up and addendum to that, because Jim's really noting it right there. On this episode, it's the Raging Oscars, and we basically talk about events right up to current. So uh, if you, last week's po books, if there's something that you haven't read there that you don't want spoiled, you're probably going to want to make sure to read it before listening to this episode, because uh, we, we basically made everything from the last year fair game right up to date. Just kind of keep that in mind as you listen, and without further ado, then, let's talk some comics. Through the magic alchemy of nature's most awesome sources of energy, Ray Palmer, atomic physicist, becomes the Atom. Jim, we're at the Raging Oscars, and, and we've done this, as I've mentioned previously, we've done this different every single time we've done it, because we want it to be fresh. Um, obviously, with the nature of our show, you and I tend to be extremely positive, because we like to talk about the things that we enjoy the most that have been happening. So, it's often for us, we don't, you know, it's not a bash fest, we don't read our comics that way. It would be fake if we tried to do something like that. So, we've always tried to do the Oscars each year with some form of theme, and you came up with a really good one this time that kind of forced us to do something we're not comfortable with. We had to do top three in certain categories, but the categories are more concept-based than, like, best title, best this, best that. Obviously, within the categories that you came up with, the concepts, we're talking about the individual titles. And I thought this was a unique way to do it, especially because we had to limit ourselves to three. No ties, uh, no, you know, these, uh, you know, this is honorable mentions, where we end up talking about seven different things outside of it. Uh, we, and we both are guilty of that in our own 
own way. We, I, I really stuck to that. It was very, very hard to do because I really had to eliminate some things that I really enjoyed from this year. But in the end, I've got a list of things that fit into each of the category, each of the categories that are present here that I'm really proud of. I really feel like they're things that stuck out for me this year as being something unique and interesting. Uh, how was this experience for you, trying to limit down to three? Because you created this. I mean, this yeah. really is your your baby. And, and I do have some honorable mentions. <laughs> You, but, but we had a category for honorable mentions that was at the end. So you have honorable mentions within the categories? Yeah. We said no. I know. <laughs> you're breaking, you right away before we even started, you're breaking the rule. I didn't break the rule. I actually stuck to the rule. <laughs> oh, this is funny. Uh, this is already getting funny. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, we were we were discussing beforehand how are we going to handle disputes. I've got my first dispute. <laughs> I, I will keep my honorable mentions to myself. Then I will keep. I I, I, I will stick to the rules. I had a couple honorable mentions. I was hoping to God you had a couple. So you say, oh, I got a couple too. Oh, no, okay, I just, you know, I embrace. We the, just roll with it. Which is, I embrace the theme because you didn't do that. <laughs> I embrace the theme of really tasking ourselves to staying with three. <laughs> I've got a solid three. I've got a solid three. So I, you know, I, the thing that I think is funny about that is we gave ourselves an honorable mention category at the end. Yeah. And you still did honorable mentions. <laughs> That's funny. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Why, why don't we Why don't we kick off with who has had the best year? We had two categories: who has had the best year and who has had the worst year. And the idea behind this was to think about characters that we've read this year that we thought fit into these categories and to talk about why. So, Jim, why don't we start off with you? Who did you? You know, how did you do your top three of who has had the best year? Well, you know, again, it, I kind of looked at it as if I was inside the DC universe and I was a person who knew all the secrets. I was kind of like the watcher of the DC universe so i knew all the little hidden gems that everybody has gone through and just said who had the best year and it was just basically the mindset i had and uh for my number three man for you know who had the best year i went with batman now batman had a tough year he had a very tough time but the one thing that kept him on the list was the thing that any parent would ever say you know, would be the worst tragedy he was able to overcome. And that was the return of Damien. And yeah. I think just the fact that, you know, yeah, he went through literally hell to get Damien, but he got his son back. And I think the fact that a father gets his dead child back, would he'd have to be in the top three of people in the best year, G even given all the crazy stuff that happened to him. Just that one major event is that one thing that he could really hold on to and say, yeah, this was a good year. Number two for me was Hal Jordan. Again, another person who's had a tough year. He's had a very difficult year with the leadership of the Green Lantern Corps, especially considering how issue 40 goes. Things are not really too well for Hal. But as an overall you know, hero, you look at what he's done. You look at all that he's accomplished. You know, and you, you have to say, he had a pretty good year there. That's a pretty decent year with, you know, um, stepping up to the role, getting the respect of the Corps, getting started kind of earning back some respect from different members of the galaxy, you know, earning back the new gods. When he went over the new gods, I thought that was a huge thing, just showing just, again, what a true hero, what a true Green Lantern's about. I thought those were some really cool, you know, stuff. And I'm like, man, you know what? Hal's had a pretty good year. That's pretty decent for him. But my number one person who had the best year for me was hands down. This actually, when I first created this category, I created this category with this person in mind. And the reason I said, who has the best year? Not which hero has the best year? Because my number one is Lex Luthor. My God, dude had the greatest year ever of anybody. He goes from being public enemy number one, not just to the U.S., but the entire planet wanted him dead, want him incarcerated. Everyone's thinking he's this massive villain to being the man who saved the world. Not only does he save the world by taking out the evil versions of the Justice League, he does it when the Justice League is completely captured. So he escalates his moments. Then add on top of it, he gets part of the Justice League. Something Superman can't even fight. So now he's in the Justice League. Oh, add one more thing to it. He knows Batman's secret identity. He can walk up to him and say, hey Bruce, how you doing? Stuff he kept doing, which was something I absolutely loved every single time I saw it. He is back in charge of LexCorp. He is once again a multi-super billionaire. 
Everybody loves him. It's, you know, he went from the, being the worst criminal possible to being the number one hero of Earth. You got to give him best year. It's it's funny. We had a very different group of characters for ours. Uh, I don't really have a lot of disputes for yours, other than I, I would argue that Hal Jordan had a horrid year. <laughs> 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 and, and and I say that I loved that about Hal Jordan's book, but I get that you were going for the fact that he persevered throughout that and found successes in spite of all that. So I get where you were going with that. So I really, I really quite enjoyed that. My number three was Superman. I think this was a great year for Superman. If you look across all of the titles that he was in, you saw a character emerge that gives you more of a concept of what Superman is really all about. You know, we've talked on the show many times about, you'd always do the dun-da-da, you know, and the truth, justice, in the American way, and all that kind of thing about Superman. Those are qualities that are larger than life. They're concepts. Superman, in and of itself, is an inspirational concept when he's done right. You take a look at the book that really kicked it off for me was Action Comics, uh, especially when you had that supernatural story arc going on with Superman. It was great to see him, you know, magical and mysticism and all that and Superman don't mix very well. Yet this guy perseveres in spite of the danger to himself. He finds a way to inspire those around him who think maybe they're experts in situations. And Superman finds a way to get through it. He brings in team members. And you saw that in that story arc where he brought in Steel, he brought in Lana. He's bringing, you know, various characters, people from Smallville, characters that he's encountered, you know, from other stories. And they're all brought in and they become something more in the Superman world. I really love that. I love that elements of Superman and Batman were brought into, or Batman and Superman were brought into that story as well. I like the idea of editorially the Superman universe started to get tighter together. You had two characters that were very Superman-like that he went up against. Each story wound up being unique because of Superman's interactions with them. Their backstories were different. Superman somehow, in his own way, inspired both characters to become something more in certain situations. One went horribly wrong for that character where his whole world was destroyed, but Superman's point was still valid. Is this who you are? You are one of us, you are a human, you are a part of our world, and how can you let our world falter? I found this was a year where we got to see Superman step up and Superman really be that figurehead. Superman's the guy that in the DC universe, if you're going into a major battle, Superman should be your guy leading your charge and you should believe that people would follow him. This year, I believe people would follow him. Not always in previous years. It was great writing this year to put Superman back in that place again. He's a character that I would I could easily see in Convergence other heroes rallying behind. And that's a, a unique and important distinction for Superman. If you don't have that with the character, something's missing. Second character for me is Dick Grayson. The guy died. <laughs> <laughs> Gave up his entire identity. Lost everything. And turned that into, you know, the, this whole concept of going undercover with Spiral. He became DC's James Bond without losing himself. It was Dick Grayson in that role. He wasn't Sean Connery. He wasn't Daniel Craig. He was Dick Grayson taking on that role. He had to deal with morality issues and still, in his own way, wind up being, you know, Helena started to come over to his side. Uh, Minos, you know, started to recognize his value, but also recognize that maybe I can't trust this guy because Dick Grayson on the sly was doing what he could to protect fellow heroes recognizing what Spiral was up to. I love that even in spite of the fact that his status quo had changed, we saw Dick Grayson being of value in the Batman universe besides still being in his book. I was greatly afraid with him being in this book that we would lose him in the rest of the Batman universe. That didn't happen. And I loved how creator t creative teams found a way to use him in ways that didn't negate what he was doing in his own title. It was a great year. One of the best stories for me, and it's going to come up again in this episode, was that desert story where he's walking with the baby and still finding a way to carry on and persevere. That not give, never give up attitude that's Dick Grayson. I really liked that. He brings hope. 
I've always enjoyed his contrast to Batman. I've loved his athletic skills, but I've also liked that he's the big brother. He is the guy that you look up to that you never can. He's too cool to be like you want to be him. He inspires you to want to be that cool. And you knew, you know, you'd be a buddy with him. Like I would want to hang with him. I would want to be his buddy, but I would always be just a hint of jealousy towards him because you know that you couldn't quite be him. There's a swagger to Dick Grayson that just works. This book, Grayson, embraced that. The swagger was still there, but the accessibility was there too. And you saw it by, you know, the girls kind of swooning over him. You saw it by the way villains interacted with him. You saw it by the way he handled situations. Oh my gosh, in the artwork, the use of the acrobatics with this character. I mean, he just had such a cool year where it was like, I want to be him. There was not a single issue of Grayson where there wasn't a moment where I'm like, I wish I could do that because it just looks cool. And that's why I, he was my number two. My number one, it's very funny that we both picked villains. <laughs> um, and it's, it was funny how I was thinking through the year, what character really had a great year? I picked the Joker. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the guy had his face cut off in the beginning of the New 52, right? And then we saw all that stuff with Death of the Family. He had some horrible things happen to him, yet he still managed to somehow get a face again, embed himself into Arkham with an entirely new identity that none of us saw coming, and then take over Gotham. He found this new strain of the, you know, that tied in with the Court of Owls and everything like that of the Joker gas really wound up doing this thing that like made him larger than life. The stories that he told and the way that he embedded himself into the cultural history, I believe it's all bunk. I don't think he, what he said was true, but he had me believe in it. I mean, it was creepy enough that I'm like, are they really doing this with him? Are they really showing that he's, you know, been around for, you know, over a hundred years? And if so, do I believe that? And, and do I like that? And I, d I don't know to this day that I have an answer whether I liked it or not, but I was believing it. He conned me. Oh, yeah. I mean, talk about a guy who went from being, like, one character into being the most important character in Gotham in his vicious way. He had a great year, <laughs> whether you liked it or not. He found a way to get in on the inside and take over everything. He was controlling everything in Gotham. Um, and it made for great storytelling. I'm not saying that I, I think the Joker's the greatest thing in the world, but he had a great year. <laughs> you know what? I won't argue. I will not argue that point. Um, it's funny because I was thinking about Joker as well. Mm -hmm. And I, part of the thing was I just – I was like – and I, I just can't give it to the Joker just because he is just, you know, it, it just the fact of – but, you know, I see your point of saying, yeah, he did have a great year for the Joker. Yes. <laughs> And I love the fact that he was there longer than we realized. Yeah. Like, we had seen the Joker back much earlier than we thought, and I would have never seen that coming. And I've got to say, the backup stories in the Batman title, telling us what we didn't see on screen, were just as interesting to me as the main story, and actually added to the reason why I chose him. I don't know if those backup stories were there. I probably would have said, you know, Joker's... I would have probably aired more on the side of Batman or, you know, done something about how great these stories were with the Joker, but it wouldn't have been him. The backup stories really added to my sense of scope and scale. That's where it really hit a home run. And uh, that's a great example of why you need those short stories in the back sometimes to flesh something out. They're side stories. They, they add a background. They add a history to it and show us those things that happened off camera that we didn't see before that I really wanted to see. So that's really what set him over the top. It wasn't just the main story, which is phenomenal. It really is the end game backstory that fleshed out more of the Joker's world. And it was, I think, incredibly necessary. Who was your honorable mention? Or what did you do for honorable mention? What for this kid? I thought I thought you said wait. No, 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 no. Let's go ahead and do it. As soon as you, as soon as you did it, let's not waste well, it. I didn't do honorable mentions for every one. Okay, then then let's on the ones where you did a, you did them. Let's do it after the end of the category and let's go yeah. over them. Worst year? Who had the worst year to you? Well, here's an interesting statement for me. 
my worst year is one kind of related to my who had the best year. You know, you think if Lex Luthor had the best year, who would probably be have a really bad year? And I went with Superman. You know, and it's funny because hearing how you put him in your best year category for number three, I was laughing because I gave him the number three spot because of a lot of the turmoil that he went through. You know, with you think about a whole the the emotional side of that fact that an entire dimension is destroyed because of him. You know, the fact that you know every you know just the the massive death, the massive destruction that he's seen, the uh, death of the Langs, having his parents' animated corpses come back from the dead, having Lex. Luther be the celebrated hero of Earth. All these things for me put Superman at the worst year, you know. And it's he's not the the worst. He's a number three spot. So there are a couple other people ahead of him. But I, you know, it's funny as much as every time he always accelerated over that, and he was always like dun da da. He still he answered the call and he stepped up. There's still just that beating down of the guy. I'm like, man, I felt bad for him at times. You know, when you sit there and go, wow, that's, he's had some tough, tough, tough stuff, especially a lot of the emotional spectrum he was put through this year. I think that to me is, you know, it's easy when you're invulnerable to get beat up because you're invulnerable, you heal, you're when you're Superman, but it's those emotional punches that he took. You know, you think about with his version of the Joker, everything that he had to deal with through that whole story arc. Everything he had to deal with every time Smallville was attacked multiple times, every time Metropolis was attacked multiple times, all these emotional hit on him for me, that gave him the number three spot for uh, worst year. It's, you know, it, it, it's kind of funny because he did have a good year and I'm not going to argue whether he had a good year because he did rise up to the challenges. But with each one of those rise up to the challenges, he had an equally emotional thing hitting him. And I kind of felt bad for the guy. Now, my number two spot is Hal Jordan. <laughs> yes, he was the number two spot for best year, but he was also the number two spot for worst year, oh, which funny. is why I was laughing when you said, I could have thought he had a bad year. Yeah, he did. He had a, it was the best of times. It was the worst <laughs> of times for old Hal Jordan. And I think, you know, it was the, the fact that he always had those, you know, massive, you know, being public enemy number one. He had, he lost his girl. He thought his best friend, one of his best friends was dead. Good news, he came back, but he spent most of the year thinking Kyle was dead. There's all these just emotional roller coasters he was going through. And then with the episode four, with issue 40, where he fi- we see the ending of how this year ended for Hal, he had to make the worst year for- list for me. But I was kind of laughing because I was like, yeah, he had these great moments. He had these terrible moments. So put him on number two on both my lists. Cool. My number one worst year goes to Batman. <laughs> yeah, he was three on the list because he had that great moment of Damien. But everything else that happened to him this year, he just, you know, he goes from how, you know, with the Joker rise up, death of the family, you know, death of the family hits him hard. Uh, the Joker gas comes back. The Batman eternal Alfred loses his hand. Um, he did within this year, he kind of, he was dealing with Damien's death. So there's a lot of emotional stuff going on with him. You know, Bat's just, he is just that, that, you know, it's the dark, you know, the dark hero, the dark character, but he's also kind of emotionally messed up. And he had a pretty tough time with just everything just pounding on him. You know, you, when you start doing the timeline of all the craziness that has happened to Batman, all the craziness that has happened to Gotham, you know, his sitter, city was literally burning. Literally. They set the thing on fire. Man, I was like, wow, because you look and you just, it's not just a building here. It's not, they, blanketed the city and he's scrambling he's got the full team bat scrambling and it's the body count that is so high in the bat titles this year of civilians of people around of just family friends just people he know it is astronomical and there's nobody like how i said luther was my number one pick right from the very beginning batman was always my number one pick for worst year just because of Every single thing he got hit with this year. And it's something he constantly keeps getting hit with. And it's one of the cool things about Batman that he has all this nastiness happen to him. And he keeps rising up. He has no powers other than he is just awesomeness. So, you know, it's yeah, I love the character. I love the stories. I feel really bad for the guy just because of what he's gone through. I'm going to start off with my number three. And this is the only one I'm crabby about. With every other one, I, I they added something to the story. This one, it bothered me enough 
in a book that I'm really enjoying that I had to note it. And it's Mr. Terrific. He's my number three. The reason why he had the worst year is, oh my gosh, what happens to him in the future that he becomes so unlikable? <laughs> I mean, um, <laughs> I'm loving him in Earth 2. I, I think what they've done with him over there is great. I'm really enjoying that character. He's a little bit closer to the, the version that I really liked when Jeff Johns was writing him years ago. Uh, he's a he's a breakout character. That version of him is a breakout character and what Jeff Johns did with him. Then something goes horribly wrong in the New 52 Futures End with him to the point where I just can't stand him. I mean, I really dislike the portrayal of him. Uh, he's He's driven in the wrong ways. And I don't think that's in his character. What would correct it for me is is a story explaining why he became this way. And I don't feel we've gotten that enough that it would warrant this character that he is. What he's done with Brother Eye, I want to see that he's manipulated. I need to see that he's being manipulated in the future. I mean, we, we do see elements of that, but I don't see that he's been, like, you know, taken over or controlled or anything like that. Especially when you see him interacting with Batman. He's supposed to be one of the smartest men on Earth, but that's not all he is. And I think that concept has overshadowed the real good guy that's there. He was a leader that would inspire you because he wasn't just smart. He's a good guy, too, and you really like him. He is a character that you can look up to. The Earth 2 version of him really digging. And let me clarify, I'm really loving the New 52 Futures End. I'm enjoying reading the story. So it bugs me when I'm really digging a book so much that there's this one major chink in the armor. <laughs> and it, for me, it's him. Um, they, they really have, uh, Michael Holt has been mishandled, I think, in that book. I want to be wrong. I want them to show me that there's something that I haven't seen yet, and I hope I get that. Otherwise, terrific book, a character that's really bothering me with his portrayal, and that's that's my one crabby negative one. The second one, this is a, this has actually been to a story benefit. It's the Clue Master. He had, let me explain why he had the worst <laughs> year. He did the impossible. He took himself from being a nobody and turned himself into the biggest somebody in Gotham in a story in a way that I did not see coming. Then Thomas Wayne killed him. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's kind of like, you you had the keys to the gate. You did all these things. What he did to Jim Gordon, the whole setup. I loved the issue where we saw everything laid out that, like, you finally made it, only to have it yanked out from underneath you. <laughs> I, I don't know how you can get much worse than that. Like, he, he finally was telling... Batman something that would have made him easily, if not an A-list villain, a B-list villain, you know, where all of a sudden he could be used elsewhere, then he died. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought I was, I was like, it's, and I, it was a great storytelling moment because it was the guy that took him out was one of the guys that was on my top list of being the big bad in the story. And he winds up being the salvation, at least in that segment. So we'll see where that ends up going. But it was funny how he, he wound up in, he probably would have been in my best list if it wasn't for that moment. Yeah. <laughs> and I did separate them. I, I didn't like give them a partial each, but I agree with the reasons why you did what you did. You saw it differently than I did. My number one's the same as yours. It's Batman. Um, <laughs> How can you have a more horrible year? Watch Dick Grayson die in front of him. Brings him back to life. No, he didn't, actually. Lex Luthor saved him. And then he had to basically tell Dick, you need to give up everything you know and love. Go underground. You know, become this agent. He lost Damien and went on this quest for Damien where he really had to cross lines on an incredibly overwhelming level. Jim Gordon goes... And, and winds up uh, in jail for a crime that he didn't commit. Batman can't prove it until it's way too late. When he's able to get that, you know, basically get to the point where he can save Jim Gordon, it's ignored. His relationship with the police is completely decimated. His city is in ruins. I mean, Endgame's going on with the Joker. The Joker comes in. He's under Batman's nose all along. Batman's working with him, not recognizing that he's working with the Joker. <laughs> uh, what more could possibly have gone wrong for this guy this year? Alfred loses his hand. Alfred almost dies. Uh, you know, it's just thing after thing after thing. His relationship with the Bat family was strained for quite a bit of the year. It seems like those fences have been mended due to circumstances, but... 
what a bad year this guy had. It couldn't get much worse than that. And I'm with you. It To me, it's Batman's ability to persevere in spite of all that and somehow win that makes him so interesting. I wouldn't have traded any one of those stories for anything in the world, but my gosh, what more can you do to this guy <laughs> in the course of a year? <laughs> we just got to get one issue for the guy, just where he laughs and has some fun again. Yeah, well, that, that, I, I, think, I just want to see Batman smile again. That's the key to Batman and Robin, I think, has been that he's, that's been the book where he's at least had a couple of moments like that. Yeah. Um, and and we'll, 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 I'm sure we'll end up talking about that book again. Next Te- we got. Team I would want to be a part of? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, go for it. Well, my number three spot has a caveat with it. Okay. Okay, because when I was looking at this, I kind of, you know, I took it as if the teams, if I had, you know, not me, Jim Segulin, personally. You Mm -hmm. know, it's like a, I would have to be a person who could actually fit into the team. So for my number three spot, for me to fit in the team, I'd have to be a thief. And I'd have to be a villain. And I'd have to be a rogue. Mm. I love the absolutely love the rogues. You know, just the fact that they've got that concept of it's not about world conquer. It's not about domination. It's about the score. And rogues look after rogues. Now, to get on the team, you got to earn your dues and you got to pay the price and you got to actually, you know, step up and prove you're worthy of it. So I'd have to have some cool, you know, gimmick, you know, that would make me an actually worthy of the rogues. But assuming I could do that. I would love to be, uh, if, and assuming I was a thief, granted, you know, I'm an honest person, but assuming I could get beyond the whole honesty thing and actually steal from people. I think the Rogues, you know, has been just an always a solid team. And it's it was especially, you know, seeing them through uh, the Forever Evil stuff where they really gelled again as a team to defend their city. You know, they weren't going to join the big bad, say, no, this is us. This is who we are. You're not destroying this city. This is our city. You know, partially also because of, you know, you know, um, the sister being there and she was on life support. But again, it's the code. You know, one of them needs to be protected. So they protected her. So I, I was just like, I always kind of dig that. Now my number two team, I would be, want to be a part of. And again, this is assuming I have the willpower to actually man a Green Lantern ring, but I would always love to be a Green Lantern just because of the concept of the, you know, that intergalactic police force. I always thought it'd be a neat thing to have not only the power, but the authority to do something about it. And it's not just about go find, you know, bad guys are doing this, beat them up. No, it's about enforcing the law. It's about enforcing justice. It's about, you know, the core. It's about, you know, the protection of the galaxy of, you know, of, you know, just of the protection of each other. There's been so many times that you see the Green Lanterns calling for backup. And how many times do people scramble to rescue because that's what you do when you're part of this group, when you're part of this core, when you have this belief, you know, and it's just not just about one hero. This is an actual team that is together. This is a team that is functioning and flowing and, you know, and together, you know, so it's, I, you know, the concept of the Green Lantern Corps has always been huge for me. So naturally it is a team I would want to be a part of. And my number one spot, just because it's kind of interesting that it's got a ring and the ring is blue. Yep. The blue lanterns. I, again, I would like to think I'd have enough of the willpower, enough of the hope, enough of that, just that positive energy that I could actually wear a blue ring. And I think for me, the fact that it's the all will be well, it's that that concept of it's not about going up and beating the bad guys. This is the fire support. This is, these are the people who are going to go out there and help the, you know, the, the, the individuals rise up and, you know, you know, it's they never lose hope. And I love just this, the notion behind it that, you know, the initially the they're going out there with just their auras and just the shielding. And it's not about initially the construct constructs, but St. Walker, of course, eventually is able to formulate stuff. And it's, you know, as the characters would grow, you would see just that ability to tap into, you know, other cores and whatnot. But it's just that notion of hope. All will be well. I think that is just such a cool concept that, you know, I don't know if i'd be honestly able to pull it off you know because i do have pessimistic sides sometimes but if i could ever aspire to one core where just the pure hope of the fight you know where you're in the middle of the fight you're like all will be well you know yeah we've got a thousand people swarming on just little old me but it's gonna be okay 
all will be well. And just that notion of calm, I think, is just for me is something that is was always something I really dig and I loved seeing. Especially, you know, you get those moments where Walker loses his hope, but it's the ring is still there. It's like the ring had faith that Walker would eventually get his hope back. Oh. And, you know, and he was just, hey, and so it's not just St. Walker who is hope, but it's also the core itself. It's about that. And I was like, those are just, for me, that was just a neat concept of the thing. And I would love to be a part of that. I was ready to dispute you. And let me explain why I was ready to dispute you. One of the rules, and we didn't talk about this at the beginning, and we really should talk about it now. One of the rules was that um, our decisions had to be influenced by what happened during the last year. And what was last year would have been all of 2014, and, and obviously we couldn't ignore things that we read in 2015 leading up to this episode. So when you were talking about the Blue Lantern Corps, I'm like, what are you talking about? You want to be a part of the Blue Lanterns and everything that happened with them. But then then you went into uh, where you're talking about how Walker lost the ring and, and the ring was hanging out with the Hope, and I'm like, okay, all right, I'm getting it now. All right, he's 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 latching on to what was going on this year with it. So I was almost going to dispute you on that one, and I'm like, oh, you corrected it. You got me with the zinger. So I don't really have a dispute for you on that. It was cool. And I agree with you. I actually think uh, the journey of St. Walker this year was very interesting, where he thought he lost hope, but it was actually hidden and buried very deep there within, and we saw it rise up again, and I found that quite interesting as well. So my teams I'd like to be a part of, uh, I started with Batman and Robin. Now, I know they're not a team, so to speak, like your superhero teams. And I looked at the concept of what do I consider teams? What's anybody who's partnering up regularly? Um, That can be a very small team of one-on-one, or it can be a larger group, you know, like your Justice Leagues and things like that. And the reason why I picked Batman and Robin, this year we had a very interesting storyline where Damien was out of the picture. And we saw Batman teaming up with everybody and their uncle. And each person that he was teaming up with uh, led to us seeing a different facet of Batman. But also, I think it blatantly showed us that the relationship between Batman and Robin is very unique. (laughs) (laughs) And in the way that it works, whether it's been Dick Grayson, it's been Tim Drake, it's been Jason Todd or Damien, each one of those relationships, or Stephanie Brown, each one of those relationships has been very unique. And, and Carrie, actually, we put Carrie Kelly in that as well. All the Robins have had a very unique relationship with Batman. They felt like partners. There is nobody Batman worked with during that time that felt like partners. Aquaman, you could argue, that felt like a friend. But even so, Wonder Woman, you know, felt like friends. But even so, the relationship between them was not that same thing that you get out of Batman and Robin. When Damien returned... The great part about this year was, through showing us all of those other people with Batman, it made me long more for Robin to be there. I wanted Robin back. And specifically by the end of it, I only wanted Damien. I really wanted Damien back at the end of this. I wanted Bruce to succeed in this quest. I wanted to see the two of them together again. And this book ended... Are you current? Yes. Okay. This book ended with probably the biggest feel-good moment between the two of them, between father and son. Uh, how it ended between the two of them with Batman smiling and swinging off. It was that moment that, you know, you, you long for in this horrible year that this guy had. He had a great moment with his son right there. Oh, the power was exhausted in the way that all played out. I really loved the way that that book ended. I loved the relationship between the two of them. And I loved that it made, meant more to me because of how we got there this year with the two of them. I really love Batman having Robin. I love that relationship between the two of them. I think uh, there's been every single Robin has had some special quality that's made that relationship interesting, that makes them feel like brothers, makes them feel like partners. I know this is father and son in this case, but it is that there's a there's a relationship between them that's very different than when we see Batman with Superman, for example. And I think that's what works about it. My second one, similar route, Superman Wonder Woman. Since issue one, that book has been one of my favorite books. And the reason why has been the great relationship development. And this year, I think, has been really a capstone. Superman and Wonder Woman takes us and shows us a different side of each character in a way. And I will actually argue, prior to some of the big events this year in Superman, Superman Wonder Woman was my Superman book because I was getting the most interesting Superman in those stories through his relationship with Wonder Woman, through trying to show her the world, through trying to um, develop a personal life with her that was independent of them being superheroes, trying to get her to know Clark Kent as well as she knows Superman. And 
the two of them meeting somewhere in the middle. You know, we always talk about uh, with Superman, that third person. It's He's not really Clark Kent. He's not really Superman. It's when he's kind of both of them <laughs> that we get to see the real guy. And I think trying to show Diana, that person in this book, has made that book so interesting to me. And to see a real relationship between a couple play out that way with two of these big characters, I think there's been a lot of forward progression for both characters through that book, if that makes sense. I feel like these characters started off, especially Wonder Woman, you know, it was, it was uh, very much a, a relaunch of sorts in her title. And I think we've seen, and Superman obviously was a relaunch as well in his book. We've seen these characters mature and grow to the point that I feel there's a history now with them because of a title like this and that relationship. So they were uh, a team. I would love if my wife had superpowers to be able to like have that kind of thing going on. <laughs> I mean, I was kind of thinking that through. I'm like, this is why it would be cool because who doesn't want that, right? I mean, that's part of the, the the geeky joy of being a superhero. It'd be like, you know, being able to actually go and do that. We dreamed of that kind of stuff, right? That was like, the, that's why Spider-Man and Mary Jane work so well when they were married. Lois and Superman work so well when they were married. You kind of like that, seeing that relationship works because you want to be the hero. So uh, it worked for me in Superman, uh, Wonder Woman. The third one's the Batman family. Now, I'm going to go back to everything I said about the horrible year that Batman had. The Batman family appeared a lot this year in Batman books, from cameos in Batman Eternal to stuff that was going on in the main Batman title, and we saw a lot of healing in that family. But here was the great thing with them. They showed up. When there's a crisis, they're there. That's family. No matter how dysfunctional things get, your family are people that, in the end, if they love you and they're there for you and all that, they step up and they show up. And in this case, a no truer testament than the fact that they're putting themselves on the line every single time. In both Eternal and in Endgame, when the Batman family's on the scene, they're in genuine danger. Like, those weren't stories where, like, they came in and trounced the competition. And, you know, because of the fact of their numbers, the Bat family won. No. It had nothing to do with that. He needed the Bat family there a lot of times just so by the skin of his teeth he could move forward his mission. And in most cases, when he left the Bat family, they were left in peril. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, Eternal and, and Endgame were both great examples of that where we see some real genuine danger to the Bat family, but they were needed there. And in many ways, they were sacrificing themselves. Not in the sense that they were trying to die. They were, you know, obviously trying to live and survive. And I, I liked that. But they knew that there was a real chance there could be some real damage done to them by the fact that they were even there. And there's something about that. And I really enjoyed them. I value the fact that um, I've had very strong friendships. You're one of them. People that I've known for, you know, most of my life, you know, are going back to school and things like that. And, and I still have those friendships. And honestly, you know, there's been all of my friends, there's been times where we bicker, we disagree, we have differences. I, what I value about my friends is our differences. We aren't all alike. We're, we bring something unique to the table. But at the end of the day, I hope I'm the kind of person that would be there for my friends through thick and thin, you know? In spite of our differences, and we might bicker from time to time, we might have disagreements, we would show up and do that. Um, I think that's what I really am drawn to when they do stories with the Batman family. My favorite Batman stories growing up were uh, Dick Grayson and Batman when they were dysfunctional. You know, when Dick went off to college and stuff like that, he'd come back home and, and Bruce and him would be butting heads. And yet you still knew that when Batman needed him, he'd be there. That carried on in the years where he became Nightwing and he would still show up and there was that dysfunctional relationship between the two of them. It plays into today's comics and I love that that is something that they haven't dropped. I love that Jason Todd has kind of started coming back over to the side of the Angels with Bruce, but it was a very long journey, and I think it's made that journey more interesting. So I do equate that with some of my friendships and my relationships. I've been very lucky that I have very long, strong relationships that aren't just family-based. They're an extended family of friends that are very close to, my, to me as well. Um, I've been very lucky that uh, I've maintained most of the friendships that I've had in my life. 
that's why I think I really dig how they've handled the Batman family this year. I connected more with the concept of them just being there for each other and stuff because of that. Not because we go and fight, you know, in the streets and stuff. But I mean, <laughs> but I mean just the fact that there is there is a longevity to that in spite of differences. And it's something that I think is really cool about the Bat family. So I don't know. I think that uh, that's that's a team that I would like to be a part of just because of the fact that uh, I think I could plug people that I know into the spots. I'm kind of I'm almost afraid to ask where I would fit in. <laughs> oh, I don't have a particular spot for it. Um, oh, OK. Yeah. <laughs> Alfred, get your hand chopped off. Remember, the Bat family had it the worst. Yeah, it's like, you, gotta, yeah, yeah. It's like you know, get your head injected and <laughs> my scarecrow stuff. I don't know. It's like, yeah. No, I didn't. I didn't have like set spots. It's more of the overall concept. Right. I wasn't planning your demise or anything. Um, it actually, genuinely, I meant it as a compliment that I was putting you into that group because of the fact that uh, you're one of the you're one of those people <laughs> that uh, you know you're just there. You know, I mean, and, I mean that's a, that in and of itself. It sounds like a very basic concept, but uh, I'm very lucky that I know a lot of people that I can rely on, no matter what, no matter what our differences are. So I, I connect with the Bat family in that. It's just it's kind of a cool thing I think about the book. Cool. Team, uh, I would not want to be a part of. <laughs> you know, this one actually went very quick for me. Mm-hmm. Oh, <laughs> yeah. uh, my number three spot would have been higher on the list, but there's only two issues of the title, and that's Secret Six. Um, yeah, I I love the title. I love the stories that are being told, but there's no way in heck I'd want to be a part of that team. You, know, you think the opening introduction to the other members of your team. You're on the bottom of the ocean inside a steel coffin. And you're being told by a mysterious voice, one of you has to die. I don't know about you, but I'm very claustrophobic as well as being buried alive underwater. Yeah, that that I'd be freaking out like Catman was. And I didn't have that year of experience that he had of, you know, the enclosed places and the, the water dripping and all the torture they did to him. I would naturally freak out like him. And it was just, yeah, it just, I love the stories. I love what they're doing with the title, but just... Yeah, that's a team I would never want to be a part of. And I think that's part of my enjoyment of it, that I so not want to be there, but I love reading about them. My number two, once again, another team, there's no way you would ever catch me being a part of, even if while I was a rogue before and I got caught and I was put in jail and they said, hey, you got this option. We'll cut some time off. You just got to join this team called the Suicide Squad. (laughs) Uh, Right there. That name says stop. You know, I think... I'm just going to do my time in prison, you know, and just keep me in Belle Reeve. Maybe my fellow rogues will break me out. Maybe they won't. Maybe I'll rot here, but at least I won't have a bomb in my head. You know, again, love the concept, love the stories, but I have no desire whatsoever to be a part of the Suicide Squad. You know, even if they, even Task Force X, that's still, it's still a freaky name. I'm, no, I I'll pass again. No, I think I just, I'll just do my time, you know, and, you know, do whatever inmates do at the prisons or knowing my luck, I'd get sent to Arkham and have to deal with that stuff. But my number one team that I would not want to be a part of. And it's funny because this was with the team when we we're first coming up with these categories. This is the first team that popped in my head as team. I would never want to be a part of justice league dark. Um, I, <laughs> Again, love the stories, love everything about the Magic Universe, except I'd never want to be a part of it. The notion of that everything has that, the magic always has the price. And me and my bad luck, I would be the price. (laughs) Um, How many times have they been locked in some dimension where the universe is crumbling on them? How many times have they been, you know, having their massive, their energies being sucked out by some various, you know, superhuman entity and they just barely get by the skin of their teeth? Again, a lot of it's skill, but a lot of it is luck. And I am one of the most unlucky people in the world. There's no way I would ever get involved with uh, the magic universe, get involved with any of this stuff, it's, I rec, you know, it's, again, as I love the group, love the reading the stories, wish them the best of luck. No, thank you. I'll stay here in Cleveland. You guys do your thing. Good luck to you. Hopefully the universe doesn't explode. 
Before I go on, uh, there's actually one thing I forgot to say about the reason why Batman had the worst year. He had his head attached to the Joker, and he was sent back through time to kill <laughs> Batman Beyond. <laughs> Good, yeah, yeah, and, 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 and I'm not sure for the Joker that was a bad thing. <laughs> I think that might have been part of his best year. I don't know. <laughs> well, that's definitely part of his best year. Yeah, um, the teams I would not want to be a part of. Uh, very similar to you, these are teams that even though I wouldn't want to be a part of them, I am so glad they're a part of the DC universe because they made such amazing storytelling this year. So I went with that same idea. I wanted to pick teams that. I don't want to be a part of, but I adore. Like, I really enjoyed them. I started first with the Crime Syndicate. I really felt that uh, this iteration of the Crime Syndicate and what they did with them was fantastic. I, I, I loved the whole ending of Forever Evil. I loved the way the team imploded. <laughs> because of, first of all, individual team turmoil, like the whole Ultraman and Owlman and uh, you know, thing that was going on with them vying for the same woman and, and things that were going on there. Um, who's who's the day, the daddy, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing going on. But besides that, I also loved that each character had individual villainous stories that made, there wasn't one member of the team that wasn't interesting and valid and evil genuinely evil it wasn't so much that they were uh a, for each other a bad team to be on i don't know where else they would be there was something they related to in each other i would not want to be around that evil and they were genuinely written as very evil and it worked for me uh, the fact that uh, the power ring story i thought was the epitome of horror uh i really loved how they handled the whole entire team, Deathstorm, the whole the whole shebang of that whole thing, Aquaman. There wasn't a single part of that that wasn't creepy and evil, and I would not want to be a part of that team on any level. And the Outsider. My second team uh, was Justice League Dark, <laughs> actually, for every reason that you said. <laughs> I loved every minute of that team. I loved every minute of that book. So fantastic. One of the things I really loved about it, you and I are big fans of shows like Buffy and, and Angel and, and things like that. And, and I love the supernatural world. There's a dark side to it. There's a dark underbelly to it. There's a flip side to the coin. Zatanna, who I would say has consistently been the most pure character in that series, has to endure such horrors around her. Uh, I love each member of the team. And I love that the team has changed over time. And, you know, even into this year, you know, with what happened with forever evil and the team had to, but, oh my gosh, I would not want to be a part of that team after they were stuck to that strapped to that machine and used as a battery and all that kind of horrible <laughs> things that they went through. Uh, just really to, to watch what happened with John and Zatanna as well and how John manipulated the team members and, and what went on there. Uh, I, I would argue that uh, Zatanna basically formed a support group after that whole event went down. <laughs> it wasn't, it was not, not, um, they were going through um, stress after everything that they went through. And that's part of what I enjoyed about it. Like, it would make sense that these people who went through similar turmoil would find kinship with each other. And I quite liked that. I would not want to go through what they went through to be a part of that team by any stretch. I found the book fascinating and unique because of it. But I, with you, I would not want to be a part of that team in a million years. The last team... This is my number one, Secret Six. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Only two issues in. And I really struggled with this one because it was only two issues. I was saying to myself, you know, should I pick a book that only went two issues? I'm like, well, why am I penalizing myself because there's only two issues? I genuinely feel this. One of the things that I really loved and was a surprise about this series was how well in two issues it crafted this dysfunctional band of misfits. And the fact that each character is more twisted than the next and... The horrors you mentioned, like them being, you know, the claustrophobic thing that was going on there. But it's not even that. It's each one of them comes with a background story, and we haven't seen them all yet. But you just know it. You know, the new ventriloquist. I mean, you don't get creepier than that. I would not want to be in the same room with that. <laughs> yeah, no, but no, yet, no way. but yet, 
you have to watch, right? I mean, you want to see. <laughs> I mean, because you can't, like, like really? Is that, like, is is it legit that she thinks that thing's alive? I mean, and yeah, she does. It's crazy. It's, it's a whole bunch of crazy. Even though she's the one causing it to be animated like that. And Catman, what he went through, I thought, in two issues, great job of development of what's driving that guy's fears. And I just can't wait for more. I loved the handling of Black Alice. Each of the characters, I love the handling of them because there's something really creepy about that book. We don't know all the tales yet, but I'm interested. I would not want to be on that team in a million years. I want to watch them from a distance, though. Yes, from you know, a large it's, it's, distance. <laughs> there's from some a cre- safe distance. <laughs> there's some creepy crime shows that are on at nighttime, you know, where um, you can kind of see those true crime stories, the unsolved, you know, uh, you know, cold cases, you know, those television shows and things like that. And I watch them, but there's a certain creep factor to them, you know, where it just kind of like you feel icky afterwards. And Secret Six has that. It's icky. You feel icky afterwards, yet you're so drawn into the next issue because of how it's a good kind of icky. <laughs> <laughs> and it winds up being my number one. It's one of the reasons why, you know, I, I don't want to be a part of that team in a million years, yet I want to follow it. <laughs> and see what's going on. So uh, yeah, yeah, it was a that's a, that was a good category because I I literally was trying to think of something. How am I going to interpret this? Like, how does this work for me? And how do I interpret this? And that was a fun one because each one of those teams, for as much as I don't want to be a part of them, I so enjoyed reading them this year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and Secret Six, as you said, it was a tough call. I eventually I went just because of. The two issues. Mm-hmm. That's why I put it at the third. But to be honest, I could see why you would throw it at one. Just because of, in two issues, they crafted a, mm. oh, God, no. No way would I want to be on that team. And, and and let me clarify. I was toying with either putting it number three or not putting it at all because of the two issues. And I'm like, this is stupid. If I'm taking the category seriously, I've got to put the teams where I genuinely feel they should be. So I wrestled like you did. And I was so connecting with you when you were talking about, like, because I could tell you were... You were trying to justify it, and you were feeling like, you know, am I right putting this in there? And I'm like, oh, this dude went through the same thing that I went through with this one. But I ended up putting it at number one because I'm like, I've got to just kind of go with it. It doesn't matter how many issues I've read because there's many of my things on here that wound up being in a certain category because of one great issue. Uh, Grayson, a lot of my love from Grayson, I, I believe me, I adore that whole series, but that desert issue really had a major impact on me. So there's so much that's weighted on how great that one was. Uh, in a ser- I mean, I was a series that just does real well. So I, I, that really was what justified for me. If I'm taking certain books and I'm basing them on, and you'll actually hear me and through some of my other justifications, there's certain issues that really made me feel a certain way about certain characters. If it's only one or two issues that are making me justify this character being there why wouldn't six be just as valid because of it and that's that's really what sold me on six i went i went back and changed it afterwards because i'm like i'm doing this elsewhere it's just the book has had more issues not that i'm using more issues to justify my reasoning character you want to team up with character i would want to team up with my my number three is probably going to surprise some people Mm -hmm. you know the fact that he's only at number three and that would be superman (laughs) Mm. you know i don't it the reason being I love Superman. I would love to be able to say I can keep up with Superman. But in the end, I know me. (laughs) Even if I was Kryptonian, I would not be Superman. And I would feel like I was holding him back. But I still would want to team up with him because it's Superman. How awesome is it to team up with Superman? You know, and he's just, again, it's that level of... You know, the amount of what he deals with every day, the massive, massive, just these big, you know, the world is in his hands and he's got to rescue them. And just that that level of seriousness, I would have an issue keeping up with him on. So that's why he's at number three, because you look at some of the stuff that he's done throughout this year. It's just monumental picking up cities, doing, you know, it's... It's Superman stuff. It's dun, 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 moments. And I'd love to be the guy sitting right next to him standing. But I know me. I, I don't know if I could keep up with him. So he's at three because I definitely would want to have it's on my bucket list to be on Superman. But if I'm being honest, 
you know, I don't know if I can keep up with the man. I don't know if I, I, I don't want to be that partner <laughs> mm-hmm. that holds him back. Where <laughs> instead of he, he's rescuing the, the, the civilians and he's rescuing Jim. I don't want to be that kind of partner for him. So, you know, <laughs> so I'm, so I'm going to keep I'm it. I'm bowing out because of my stamina. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh, yeah, it's that. Now, my number two is Aquaman. Now, this is a caveat that I am an Atlantean as well, that I can breathe underwater, that we're doing stuff like that. Because, again, me as a normal person, it'd be tough. And, yeah, you could wear the suits or you can be in a sub, but it's still not the same. I'm assuming that I got, you know, like I'm kind of like an Aqualad type thing where I could keep up with him and actually, you know, do the, you know, duke it out. I've always been one, an underwater person. I've always been a swimmer. So I think I could hold my own. Plus, just the, you know, you look at the kind of team player he is, you know, with the others, with Mira, mm-hmm. with the Atlanteans, with his mother eventually, with his mother's people. Aquaman is a great team player. He's still in charge. He's still the leader. He's still that, you know, he's not a reluctant leader, shall I say it, but he's still that Atlantean nobility, but he is still a really good team player. And when you get to those levels where you need something beyond what everybody else can do, he steps up and he rises. He's get, you know, thrown in lava. He gets things dropped on him and you're like, oh, he's crushed. No, he's not. He's fine because he's just that tough. You know, that is, you know, one of the things that why I would really want to team up with. Aquaman and I, you know, I would want to be a part of that uh, world and be a part of that unit. You know, and I'd want to get, you know, the fist bump from him or, you know, just it, there would be that cool acknowledgement that, you know, coming from Aquaman. And, you know, it's I don't know. It's just it's kind of a neat thing. I think he's a character that I was so glad when we got this great change in him. And then when the others came out, I was initially like, why? Wow, what's this? Then you see him again with that team dynamic. You're like, you know what? He teams up well with people. He can adjust and modify his style. You saw him teaming up with uh, Batman. You saw him teaming up with Damien. You saw him teaming up, you know, with the others. You seen him, you know, use other, hang and with, you know, adjust with other heroes. Uh, Swamp Thing, him and the, him and Swamp Thing, that team up they did was awesome because it's again he's able to adjust and modify and get his groove going. So it's I like I really dig Aquaman as a team up partner. My number one hero I would, character I would want to team up with is, to me, the ultimate team player, and that is Green Arrow. You know, you think about where Green Arrow first started with you know, you know, back in you know issue one where he wasn't exactly the best team player to where he ended, uh-huh. which is the comfort of Team Arrow and just the building of it and how he's pulling, he's calling for backup when he needs backup. He's got you know. His regular people is, you know, kind of a he's on the outs with Roy, but he's not completely on the outs. He's trying to patch that up and maybe work it out. He's got his sister. He's got, you know, Diggle. He's got now got, you know, Felicity. It's got the full team arrow concept. He's definitely somebody I would love to, you know, be able to team up with and hang. And I kind of like the fact that he's not just that massive epic world scale, you know, you know, that's out there. Now, it's funny because I'm saying this, but I said before I want to be a part of the Green Lantern Corps, which I do. You know, but if I'm looking at because I, I approach this as, you know, just, a, you know, one on one team up me and that person. I thought that's why I kind of eluded the core out of it, just because I look at the whole massive concept of the core. But just that team dynamic with Green Arrow, I think, again, it's it was partially about. Who would who makes a really great team player? And for me, Green Arrow is one is the ultimate team player superhero, and that's I'd love to team up with him. My number three, it's it's this is, was a great category, and it's, it's one of the things. Oh, good. I do have an honorable mention. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. And I do want to bring this one up for this one. My honorable mention is Wonder Woman Ooh. because you know, and I was t- I, it, she was a tough one because I wanted to throw her in there. You know, because again, she's another person that sh- she does well with team, but she does have sometimes some you know issues because she is the god of war. So that's the thing that kept her out of the top three for me. Because you know, on one hand, I'm like that'd be kind of cool to be you know throwing down with Wonder Woman, you know, hacking and slashing. But on the other hand, again, it's another one of those. I, I don't know if I could keep up with her. She's she's a tough one. <laughs> so 
kind of similar to what you did. I, I kind of embraced the idea of this was the category where I could say, based on what happened this year with these characters, who are characters? I'm like, they're super cool. I'd really like to hang with them. I just love the, you know, uh, the, like the fist bump from this character, that type of thing, the acknowledgement. And that's my number three is Batman because of that. I obviously am a Batman junkie. I grew up as a kid, that being the hero that I always wanted to. Batman was always a character I've always wanted to team up with. I haven't wanted to be Batman. And there's a huge distinction to that. I mean, that's not to say I didn't play Batman as a kid and all that kind of stuff. Sure, but it was always, I think because of the Batman and Robin relationship, I always wanted to be the sidekick. So I think there's a natural part of me that, like, when I read that character, I like to ride along. And I've referenced it on the show many times. My favorite stories of Batman are the ones where I feel like I'm riding along with him. Like, he knows something a little bit more than I do. I love, and this year's been filled with these moments... A lot of darkness that's happened around Batman this year. He had one of the worst years of his life, but there's been so many cool moments, too, where he's acknowledged a bluebird, told her good job. He did that with Dick Grayson, done that with Damien. You know, he's got these moments where, a penny, too. You've got these moments where he validates people in spite of all the horrors going on and, and how gruff he can get. You know, I mean, he can be very abrasive. But yet we've seen a Batman now that is, he's more evolved then we, we had some dark years with Batman where it was really all the time he was just unlikable by others. And I think this this variation of Batman that we've got now where he's still that driven man, but he can acknowledge people along the way. And when he does, it's rare, but when he does, it means something. And it's well written and it's judiciously used. That's why in those moments, I'm kind of like... Yeah, he had a whole bunch of stuff going on, and, and you're, in a, you're in danger when you're one of his friends and stuff like that. But man, I get why people rally behind him, because there's something about his consistency of vision and what he's, nobility of what he's trying to do, and how this man drives himself that he makes you want to be more. And when he gives you that compliment, it genuinely means something because it's so rare. Um, <laughs> his, his interactions with Alfred and stuff like that, like you want to be a, a trusted member of the team. There's something about that relationship. And I'm like, I would want to, he's not my number one, but I would love to team up with him and I, I, you know, be part of that. Second one was for me, and I'm so glad I can put this character on the list. She's not always used. Or she's sometimes a background character. When they bring her to the foreground, it's been the nice part about this character being a part of a weekly book as well as the main title. I'm talking about the Earth 2 Hawk Girl. I really genuinely loved her use this year when we got to see her in the foreground. She wasn't, you know, she wasn't always one of the main players, but boy, a great example would be like, you know, when she did team us with characters like Earth 2's Dr. Fate, for example, and it made me more interested in the character. I would love to see her continue to get more focused issues and a, and a focused arc. Uh, there's a real opportunity to show her skills for archaeology and exploration. Like, that's what I'm intrigued by with the character. I enjoy the space cop aspect of the Hawks. Don't get me wrong. But to me, they truly, when there's the, that balance of Highlander and Indiana Jones that you get with uh, the Hawks, the character has a ton of untapped potential. And I'm glad that she's continuing in Earth 2 Society. That's a character who I'd like to team up with just because I find her intriguing. So I, I want to see more of the character. And, and her use this year, when she's made appearances, they made me want more. I want to see more. They just announced, actually, one of the news bits has been that, uh, you know, that, that spinoff show that's coming out of Arrow? The one with the Atom? Yeah. There's going to be a hot girl on that one. Ooh, cool. There's also going to be a Rip Hunter. It's nice. Arthur Darville right. from um, Doctor Who. Um, that's Amy, Amy Pond's husband. Oh, okay. okay. He's going to be a uh, rip hunter on that. Ooh, so, um, cool. they're, they're bringing in a whole bunch of characters, um, for that show. And there's, there's, a, there's some that haven't been revealed yet that are going to be pretty big, but I was thrilled to death when I saw that there's going to be a hot girl on that show just because I'm, in, I'm digging this one so much and I hope it's skew, It's going to be Kendra Saunders. So it's going to be the one, uh, it's going to be, you know, hopefully a variation on this version of it uh, or, or the Kendra from JSA. And I can't wait to see that. Number one isn't going to be a big shock from my comments about him earlier, Dick Grayson. There could not be a cooler character operating in the DC Universe this year. Every appearance of Dick Grayson, especially in his own title, was filled with swagger. I just feel like if you hang with Dick Grayson, you're going to naturally be cooler because some of that's got to rub off on you. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, you kind of emulate the guy and stuff like that. Um, I would want to learn like a 25th of the moves that he's got. 
I just feel like people would be take more notice of you. <laughs> There's something about that character, but also I feel like his personality. He's an accessible character. Like I feel like you'd just be an all around better person hanging with him. You know, people would like you more just because of the fact that you you are like starting to emulate. Because you naturally want to be this guy. And there's something about him. And it really has to do with the year that he's had in that great book of his. Uh, I'm a huge James Bond fan. I was really afraid when the concept was introduced before I knew the writers that were going to be involved, that we were going to lose Dick Grayson into a James Bond kind of role. He wouldn't be Dick Grayson anymore. What elements come out of a spy book that they use for this only is enhanced by the fact that it's still Dick Grayson. And I love that fact about Dick Grayson. I would love to hang with him. I just think he's really cool. Uh, I would love in the desert when everybody else is being crabby. You just kind of keep going on and pressing on with Dick Grayson. And I, I think he's the kind of guy that, going off of what you said earlier about like not the whole stamina thing, I'm like, you know, I think I'd keep trying. <laughs> and and uh, he'd, he'd keep going on with the baby. And I'd be kind of like, all right, I'm not going to cross the finish line the same time he is, but I'm sure going to keep trying. Because <laughs> I, I want him to see that I'm there at the end, and I don't want him coming back to pick me up in something. <laughs> you know, I want to cross the finish line. Um, that was, that's the cool thing about the character. I just think there's something inspirational about him. Character you do not want to team up with. Would not want to team up with. You know, it's interesting because, you know, the comments you had about, you know, with key characters you would want to team up with. And you mentioned the Bat family. And I'll tell you something. Those are very good, solid arguments for why I would not want to team up with Batman for my number three spot. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you take a look at what the Bat family has been through. What? You know, all the just when you team up with Batman, you got to make sure you know what you're doing. Because one, if you don't, he'll just, you know, it's you can't. T- it's it's one. It's very hard to get you know to be on the team to be considered the team. You talk about how he threw that you know to you know the Bluebird good job. You know, and you feel yeah, I feel great. But getting to that point would make it tough to team up with him. You know, getting to that point of acceptance, you really got to sit there and say, "Hey, I belong here." And you got to keep fighting and fighting and fighting for it. And I, again, it's my, with my personality. You know, I don't know. Yeah, I'd get a little bit PO'd at him saying, dude, I'm here. What the heck you doing, man? Come on. You know, throw me, throw me a bone or something. Come on. And I, it, I would get very frustrated and very flustered about teaming up with Batman because of that level of, you know, of that he's not open, that he is kind of dark to you. And he is, it does turn his back on you. And there is no encouragement on the team. You know, now eventually you get the encouragement, but you got to really work for it. You got to really earn it. And it's, you know, I, I believe in hard work and dedication. Granted, but there is this, I don't know, I'm more of a encouraging the team to rise up, whereas, you know, Batman doesn't have the most, um, how do I put it, he, he's, he doesn't have the most, like, endearing qualities to him. And it's partially, again, his character, who he is, what he's been through, all the craziness that he's done with it. You know, it's not, you know, it's not in his nature to be that way. And you got to earn it. You got to take your time. And it's, you know, for those type of stuff. Plus the fact that when you got a hero who has memorials to dead partners, those are kind of people I'm like, do I really want to team up with them? He's got dead partners. You know, he's got people that he's teamed up with in the past that have died. I, who? Um, Robin. <laughs> he's alive. But he was dead. But he's got a memorial. He's got a he memorial. <laughs> he's got a memorial to the living partner. But they died. But they're alive they're now. Dead. They're two robins who are who were dead. Yeah, granted, they're back. That's awesome. But they were dead. <laughs> but here's the thing: if I die, if I die, I want a partner who's going to make sure I come back. Well, Jason not, Todd, he didn't do anything for that one, and not as a zombie. What well, he did for Damien. He did for Damien. I'm giving him credit, you know, but still the fact that he would have done it for Jason too. Died. Right there, that's you know, it's kind of like joining us a team called Suicide Squad. If you know, if your hero has had a partner who's died, you may not want to team up with him. 
he's cool and all. Again, great stories, and I understand why you put him on your number three spot. Mm-hmm. But there's no way I'm on his. He's. I'm, I'm going to want to team up with him. I'll. I'll pass. You know. You guys do your thing. Hey, here's my buddy Sean. You're looking for a team up. He'd be great for you. There you go, Sean. Batman, Sean. You guys team up. I'm going to go over here see if I can hook up with Soup or Aquaman or Green Arrow. I'm going to avoid Batman. I'm going to avoid Gotham all the time. Wait until you see me driving that car. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I have cool toys, and I would be dang it. I, I, mm-hmm. I would get a mm-hmm. ah, Sean, mm-hmm. ah, you know, moment. I would have one of those moments, but mm-hmm. maybe actually, maybe that would be my turn to be in a rogue. Wait, wait, See, wait, riding wait. In a Batmobile would, you know, that'd be the thing that would send me over to the edge and turn me to the dark side. So maybe that's how I would team up with the rogues. And it's and it and it's me. I guarantee you, well, you wouldn't have one of those moments. <laughs> Jim and Green Arrow, check this out. <laughs> How are you on those jetpacks? You know? <laughs> yeah, but your jetpacks aren't going to catch up to the Batwing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look what I can do in front of the moon. <laughs> hey, Scott, your city's burning again. <laughs> it's okay. I'm going to get up by the moon. <laughs> I'm the bad partner that's doing reconnaissance. <laughs> oh, so you're the bad partner that hangs back and goes, you guys put yourself no, in danger. No, 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 no. I'm Penny Three. <laughs> <laughs> well, that works so well for Alfred. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'll give him a hand. <laughs> Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, it's it's you know what the bad family is a very interesting debate because I think there's as many reasons to uh, say no as there is to say yes. Yeah. I'm, so, I'm sorry. I, I, again, that's in a way that's in a way that's why I don't argue. But there is a way that I don't know, man. It's I, I think a lot of it is you know just your per, general personality. And really, for me, the main thing with Batman was I know me. I the I've never been like, you know, one of those you – know, there's a lot of like motivational styles of where you yell and you tell someone they're a worthless piece of garbage and that's supposed to inspire them to rise up. That style doesn't work for me. You know, I can take toughness. I can take, you know, cold rain. Give me nasty conditions. Fine. I'll push through it. But, you know, you get nasty conditions on top of this feeling like from the superior saying, hey, you don't belong here. Fine, I don't belong here. I'm going to go over there. Then you can you can deal with your burning city. And I think it's again, it's just my personality. I think I would clash with Batman, and that's just you know, again one of the things. Now, my number two person I would not, character I would not team up with is John Constantine. <laughs> you know what? Again, as I said before, with Justice League Dark, Magic Universe, Magic has a price, and everything just. Everything that he's dealt with, he's had a couple people who were his friends, his partners, who got pulled into hell. He's had people who've been close to him who have died. There's been pretty good body count, considering himself on an alternate Earth he killed. Um, how many, well, let's see, he killed his alternate version of him from Earth 2, uh-huh. his uh, girlfriend from that Earth, um, a couple other family members from that Earth. So you got a pretty good chance that if you're teaming up with Constantine, if you don't know your stuff magic wise, you could end up being the price. And again, I understand why he does it. You know, if I had his knowledge and his power, maybe I would team up with him. But if you're not on the same level as Constantine, if you're not on that same level, he's not the kind of you know partner going into a team up that you're like oh yeah i'm definitely gonna come out of this fine we'll be fine me and constantine will work together we'll figure out a way to get through this no if john needs to sacrifice you he will and you know that's kind of the issue and i'm like so me and john no we're not partners now my uh the last character i would not team up with um i don't think you're gonna argue with me on this one because it's the joker (laughs) uh yeah, you think about it. 
how many partner you know the the one doctor that he wrote that he helped write the book with she turned out just wonderfully um the the inmates that you know she he was working with they they just turned out absolutely fabulous everybody who partners up with the joker just ends up so much better off in the end or they end up dead you know it's there's not a lot of good things that come with you know teaming up with the joker and i know we've had conversations why would somebody join the joker gang and you could say charisma you can say various things but there's never no way yeah no i would not team up with the guy maybe if he said team up with me or i'll kill sean maybe to to protect a friend or a family or a loved one maybe maybe depending on who it was you know but as a general rule no 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 team up with, with the joker so my three that i would want to team up with uh number one was harley quinn and i adore her i i think the book is absolutely hysterical She's scary erratic, though. Like, I would have major trouble wondering, like, am I ever going to... Like, could you imagine, like, you're friends with Harlequin and you try to go to your day job? (laughs) You're not going to keep that very long. Uh, She's a disaster waiting to happen around you. Yet, her book is so fascinating because she's chaos. You know, it's, it's funny. We talk about the Joker being an agent of chaos. You can actually see why Harley Quinn was so drawn to him because she's become that. She really is that to the point that she's her own category because there's a fun factor to her that is very unique. And yet she's dangerous, very dangerous and upsets people in a way that I know I'm the friend that's going to get shot. <laughs> like I find her funny. I'm the friend to get shot. Huh? I would be the friend to get shot. It'd be your friend of the friend. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, so you, well, you'd be safe as long see, as I'm. See now you're con- kind of. Con- I die, then you're in trouble. Now you're kind of convincing me that maybe it's not so bad. <laughs> <laughs> like I don't know. I'd be I'd be sad um, and stuff like that. But she's funny. <laughs> she's carrying a stuffed version of me around with her, <laughs> and she'd do that. You know, you'd be like her new squirrel. Actually, you would get the stuff version of me. She'd say, "You know what? I see how upset you are. That's a good that point. That your friend's dead. So here he is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Well, I, I guess I got to redo my list. <laughs> 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 no. Um. I. I really. I think one of the joys with her is her chaos and and how crazy she is. And I love that about her. Uh, but I would not want to team up with her because of that. I just see myself. There'd be too much after effect to it in a, in a very different way. My number two was one that I had trouble putting in this category because I think he's super cool. And it's not because of him. It's because of his family. Deathstroke. Oh, my gosh. Like, teaming up with him and running into his family? (laughs) You know, from his dad to his kids and all that. Uh, I love, love Deathstroke right now. I think it's a really, really great book. But the thing about Deathstroke is it's a great book because of the odds that uh, he's going against. He has the swagger, and and certainly everything I said about Dick Grayson's swagger applies to the Tony Daniels handling of Deathstroke right now. And it's one of the things I love about the book, but I would not want to team up with him because um, there's no guarantees when you're... There's a guarantee that Deathstroke will survive, um, but not not me. (laughs) Not at all. And and you have to be afraid that he would turn on you for something wrong that you say. My number one was Constantine, and and I'm I, that like I didn't even hesitate. That was my automatic number one. I don't want to think of him as a friend, long lost family member, gardener, personal taxi service. I don't want to see him at a con. Um, it truly seems the safest place when dealing with Constantine is to be in another book, and even that. If you saw what happened with the Earth 2 version of him, uh, there's no guarantee of safety. Um, I actually quite love that about the character. He, The fact that you see that on his television show, you see it in his book, that part of it, and you see it in his internal dialogue. He's a great example of you need internal dialogue with him because these are things he would not tell normally other people. But yet we as the reader get to see that part of him. He knows he's a scumbag. (laughs) <laughs> and and we get to see that internal dialogue. I find him fascinating to read about. Would not want to team up with him at all because of it. But yet, I love reading him. I think he's a uh, when the writer gets him, like is what we're see- which is what we're seeing right now with him. He's a very interesting character to read and fascinating because of it. Would not want to team with him in a million years because of what I know about him. Yeah, I gotta I co-sign that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Supporting oh. character you'd want to be. Well, 
supporting character I would want to be. I had a difficult time with this one. And it, it's funny because I had one supporting character that initially was thrown on the list. I didn't know where I was going to put him. And as time went on, he ends up being my number one. Mm-hmm. And it was exa- It was actually the events of issue 40 that he was in that actually put – so it's just now – recent the most recent issue that put him at the number one where i'm like yeah he i'd want to be him but my number three and my number two i don't want to cheat but i'm kind of cheating because my number three spot on the supporting character i would want to be doesn't exactly exist and here's what i'm talking about i want to be that supporting character for aquaman so i would want to be a male version of mira or a nice version of volko or a nice version of captain Tula. i'd want to be that supporting character that was right next to aquaman but not you know undermining him and not his his mate you know his girlfriend because you know yeah you know it's not how i roll um but you know it's you know so the character doesn't actually exist for me so, because I think you know, again, <laughs> you know, it's you know, as I said before, Aquaman's a guy I'd like to team up with, and I'd like to be his partner. But you know, the the character, you know, because Volko, you know, when they first introduce him, I'm like, man, that guy's a cool guy. But then he ends up turning on him, you know. And that's and Captain Tula and the, the guard are starting to come around slowly, and they're starting to recognize, hey, this is something. So maybe I could say that's who I would want to be. But it's you know, I would be, I would want to be farther along in my trust and support of Aquaman of Arthur of King Arthur. I love that for a category that's supporting character. I'd want to be. You you basically talked about a whole bunch of characters you don't want to be and made up one that doesn't exist. Exactly. I know. That's why I said I can't I'm like, I'm like, and it's so you. <laughs> like, I'm not really going to dispute it. I'm going to go, that's a very Jim answer. <laughs> so let's, let's carry on. Okay. I'm, like, I, I'm not even, even going to say you're wrong. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like you know what? <laughs> that is so you. <laughs> Now, my my number two spot. Um, again, I'm kind of cheating. If I gotta uh-huh. pick a specific person, I'll say Diggle. Okay. But as a general, to be honest, it's more of Team Arrow. I would want to be the sensei of whatnot on Team Arrow, and I would want to be a part of that, or a male version of Felicity, or however you want to. This look. is a team you'd want to be a part of. I know. <laughs> I so love that you butchered this category for yourself. <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> but again, it's, you know, because Diggle is a cool character, and I mm-hmm. would want to be him. If I had to mm-hmm. say, no, Jim, you have to pick one supporting character, I would say Diggle in a heartbeat. Mm-hmm. I really do dig this version of him. I like how he is and how he's playing off and how they're having him in the in the comic, how they've written him into the book, why he was in the book, why, you know, just the, his introduction, his backstory, everything they did with him, and then just with the recent issues. So I'd say yes on that. Or even, you know... um, you know, just the various members of Team Arrow. I I could say yes. I would want to be that person. You know, it's again as I said, this that team concept was just so great that these are just kind of supporting characters. I would want to be. These are the kind of people that I would want to be a part of. You know, and this is how I would. You know, it's like you could say, who do you want to be? Bam, this is who I want to be. So, so again, I'm kind of cheating on the first two. On you know, number three and number two. Yeah, I admit that, you know, with reason. Now, my number one is a solid one person name and I want to be Superman's best friend. I want to be Jimmy Olsen. Mm. You know, he he first started off at the number three spot because I thought he was really cool. And then as time's going on, they show him, you know, giving away his fortune. You know, to help the needy people of Gotham who, not excuse me, of Metropolis who, you know, lost everything and the people who were, you know, um, who were who were gonna go into the other universe and then came back and he's like, no, I'm gonna step, I'm gonna help all these people and gave away all the dirty money. That was like that was a cool thing. I was like, you know what? That's I like this Jimmy Olsen. I like you know the fact that he's got a strut to him and you know and he just gets out of that swagger. That's why when when number three when I first threw him at the number three spot, I'm like, you know, that's a good solid spot. That'd be kind of cool. And then just that last that last episode, that last uh, couple issues where. Just seeing him and especially that last issue, him and Superman just hanging out you know, and just those moments where Clark doesn't have his powers and Olsen's there. And then it's the end when they're sitting on top of the building, just, you know, just chilling and relaxing and just like, you know what? 
I'd love to be that right there. Again, it's you don't have the pressure of the team up of having to keep up with Superman. You're his friend. You're a supporting character. You're the sound you know board that if you know he needs to talk to somebody, hey man, dude, I got your back. What do you need? What's up? Uh, you know, I, you know, you're there for him. And I think that for me is would be the ultimate character role that I would love to be is that person that Superman feels he could trust with his biggest secret. You know that you know that is what I would want to be. When I do mine, I'm going to actually, I'm going to do an honorable mention because I wasn't going to do one, but I'm going to talk about one that I eliminated because I think it's very funny in light of what you did. <laughs> okay. Hey, I cheated. So yeah, <laughs> my number, my number three was, and I eliminated it because I'm like, it doesn't fit the category. It says supporting character. My number three was the justice league. <laughs> 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 and, and I eliminated it specifically because it was relating to Batman and Robin and their appearances in Batman and Robin relating to the quest for Damien. But then also when that issue where Damien, you know, with, was the superpowers were being drained and everything like that. And they were in there and they helped Batman craft that scenario. I just was like, I would love to be on the Justice League. I love the friendship aspect of the fact that they did all this as a way to... Uh, help Batman with Damien and to kind of do him a solid and, and kind of as a way to say, I'm sorry, you know, we didn't get it. You were right. We should have listened to you, even though it was insane what you were doing. We should have trusted you as a friend and stuck behind you in your time of need. I loved the way that that all played out. And I loved the friendship aspect of that. But I'm like, I'm doing a team here. I should have said I wanted to be on that team if I'm going to do that. So I eliminated them because of that and replaced them with Penny too. And the reason why I replaced them with Penny too. I loved the fact that Penny to, and it's, I already basically alluded to a lot of this when I said I wanted to be a sidekick of Batman's, uh, a friend of Batman's. Penny 2 brought back an accessibility to anybody could be in the Batcave. Like Robin did that for me when I was a kid. I don't want Alfred to be gone. I don't want to be Alfred. I don't want to be Robin because we like the Robins. You know what I mean? I, I kind of want to hang with them too. I want to hang with Batman Penny, too, brought, brought this idea of, well, but somebody new could be there, and then you could hang with all of them, you know? It's kind of, and she gets to play with all the gadgets and gizmos, and that's I, that's right up my alley. I love the whole tech stuff. I like the whole being an advisor thing. I like that she can go. I could see myself in the Batcave, like, training and learning to be somewhat of a combatant to defend myself. But I, I like the idea of being an advisor <laughs> and kind of like helping with the tech stuff behind the scenes because I'm not driven, but I'd like to feel like, hey, I'm a part of Team Batman. I'm helping out. I'm in a role where I'm doing something, but I'd like to train to learn how to hold my own. So like if the Bat Caves invaded, my hand doesn't get chopped off and maybe I can get a good job from Batman when I come back because I like you know, knocked out some villain or something like that, or put hush in a box or, you know, whatever. One of those. You know, I'd like to do something like that. I'd like to be that person in the Bat universe. So I felt like she added an accessibility to the whole thing. And I could have like a front row seat to all that stuff and actually feel like I'm helping. Like, I wouldn't mind Batman saying, hey, find out about these three things and you've got 60 seconds to do it. <laughs> Or to try to anticipate his needs and kind of be there in that role, be like an information gatherer. I'm like, I can do that. I can be like Batman's secretary or whatever kind of thing. I'm like, I'll do that. Um, so there's something about Penny, too, that like works there. I really respect the fact, though, that she's got a background where she can hold her own. And I like the character a lot. I'm like, I would like to be that character and bring a skill set to the table. That's what I like about her. She's got skills that are unique to her that she brings to the table. I'm interested in her. I find her an intriguing character, but there's also an accessibility to her with her being like the new face on the scene that I would like to be that character. Number two for me was Diggle. And, and here's the reason why. I wasn't sure how I felt about this character coming into... I've loved the character in the Arrow digital comic because I'm a big fan of the show. So I was already into Diggle as a supporting cast member there. I love him on the television show. So I have no problem using the digital comic as a way. But in the main book... That was the one where I was really worried about bringing him in. I'm like, how am I going to feel about John Diggle being in this book? I've really loved the use of the character. I love that he's got like this, this lost history with Ollie that we really haven't seen. You know, he was part of the previous era and he's coming back in now. And Ollie is one of those characters when he's written at his best, he gets abrasive to his friends at times where like they, they rally behind him for all the reasons you said about team arrow but he, he'll make a mistake or do something horrid that they're like, dude, you're toxic. I got to get away from you for a bit. 
but yet they're still friends, you know? And when the chips are down, they wander back into his life and they remember why they were friends with him again. And I think everyone's got friends like that where it's like, you know, I'm still friends with you, even though, <laughs> you know what I mean? And there's something about that relationship. And Diggle, I think, broadcasts that. I love that he's got skills. I love that he is that character. There's been rumors that like he might, in the television show, might become like a Jon Stewart there, become Jon Stewart. And I don't want that. Wow. I actually think, to me, I, I wouldn't have an issue if they went that route with it. But I think Diggle stands on his own. Like, I already think he's an interesting and unique and intriguing character on his own. Uh, I like that he isn't quite Ollie in his skills. Like, especially when he took on, when he put on, like, in the, in the TV show, he put on the outfit. But in the comics, it's the same thing. He's not quite up to Ollie's skills. But he still brings something to the table. He's a partner. And he's a part of the team that, you know, he's, he's an advisor. He's trusted. I want to be that advisor. I want that person that I confide in and, you know, kind of just, well, did you think about this or did you do that? Or, you know, I'm ticked at you because you've done this. Uh, there's something about Diggle that makes it, it makes it feel more three-dimensional to me. And that starts to make me feel like, wow, you could really be friends with these characters. And I love characters like that. So there's something about that with Diggle. My number one was Jimmy Olsen. And Jimmy Olsen was the one that, for me, is the reason why I plopped Secret Six where I did. I'm like, I'm being too picky. I'm not going with my gut. And Jimmy Olsen was a gut decision. And it really had to do with that issue with Superman without his powers. Um, I, Jimmy, Everything you said about Jimmy having such a great year as a supporting character, being Superman's best friend, that kind of thing, I agree with. But it was really those the reveal, the issue of the reveal, and more importantly, the follow-up issue afterwards. The issue afterwards where they were, Superman had no powers, and Jimmy was believing it was Clark with a put on, you know, and just kind of just going, hey, dude, come on. <laughs> what do you take me for? I was born yesterday. There's that sense of disbelief there because this fantastical thing's happening, and you can't believe this, that you didn't know, you know, that it was this guy. And I love the way that that all played out. I loved what you said. Jimmy gave up his fortune. Jimmy has a certain at times jimmy has this certain part of him that like he wants to be good he wants to try to do that thing but he's fallible too i like that jimmy's not perfect and he's one of those guys where i'm like you know jimmy makes it feel like you can be a real human in this world and you can be a part of it and you can be friends with these characters even though and somehow it's empowering to the fact that okay i may goof up here but I need to keep pressing forward and trying so I can step up for this character. You know what I mean? Jimmy's that guy that like makes you want to be better because he somehow keeps trying to be better, even though he makes mistakes along the way. And I really like Jimmy for that. And I just really think that he, right up until the last issue of Superman, where we got to see the after effects of Superman's reveal, bumped him into that spot because he wasn't there before that. I'm so glad he's there because I just feel that issue totally was one of the better issues that I've read this year of a comic. And I thought really broadcasted who Jimmy Olsen is in this world. I, I can't wait to see what they're going to do with him next. You know, it's funny because we both have the same people for two and one. Mm -hmm. That's kind of, I never thought that would happen. Well, I kind of was guessing it for Olsen. You know, I was thinking we both probably would put Jimmy Olsen for the thing, but you know, that's kind of cool. Um, supporting characters, I would not want to be. Um, I think we're going to be very different on this one, though. I don't think we're going to have so any matchups. What? I think so, too. I think you're right. You know, my number three is Detective or Lieutenant uh, Maggie Sawyer um, over at uh, Gotham, you know, a la Batwoman, a la, you know, the Gotham special unit. Um, one, She's a police officer at Gotham, too. She's the head of the special unit, so she doesn't just deal with the normal crazies. She deals with the extra special crazies. On top of that, she's had the, the love of her life completely gone, who then is seen with this uh, psycho crazy, you know, other, you know, just completely wrong crazy woman. You know, so, you know, so she not only does she get, you know, the... Or a job, but she gets the heart broken on top of it. Um, yeah, yeah, just you know, again, it 
one of the main things is the cop, but the other side is the fact that, you know, everything that she personally went through as a character. And there's, you know, going to be a lot of characters out there, but for some reason I really felt bad for her. And it was one of the reasons I didn't want Batwoman to end because I wanted to see the rectification between those two. I wanted to see, you know, um, you know, just, you know, her get better and her, you know, and just her relationship, everything grow with them. And that was, that was the thing that really upset me that Batwoman, the title ended because we don't get that uh, salvation. We don't get that, you know, Hey, everything's okay with her. Cause you know, when we're basically leaving her, she's kind of on a downward spiral and it's, you know, only going to get worse before it gets better for her. So it's, you know, definitely a character I did not want to be. Um, my number two and my number one, I have flip flopped back and forth multiple times. You know, and even while during our conversation, the, it has flip flopped back and forth. But I'm going to stick with this order that I have now. And my number two is uh, Jim Gordon. <laughs> um, again, you know. He was the commissioner of Gotham, which means his life would be absolutely horrific. You think about everything this Joker's done to him this past year, everything that happened with his kid. Oh, and then he gets framed for uh, killing this innocent person, gets thrown in prison. Then when the Bat family is able to rescue him, guess what? The corrupt corrupt commissioner doesn't let him out until the actual riots, where he almost dies a couple times. Um, Gordon just... Being the commissioner of Gotham is absolutely horrific, and they took it to a whole other level of horror for him. You know, and again, it's wonderful character. Absolutely love him. Love how it's written. You know, especially how the character's written is just the strength of character and just who he is. But I would not want to be him at all. And my number one character I would not want to be is Lefty, aka Alfred Pennyworth. Now. Getting your hand chopped off by the Joker is horrible. That's terrible. Getting injected with the fear toxin directly in your brain, that's another absolute horrific thing. But you just take a look at Alfred's life. And if everything is going perfect and smooth, he still has a very difficult life to have. You know, it's not only just being the the butler, the father figure to this child who's, you know, brutally watched his parents murdered. He's now the butler father figure to Batman and everything that goes along with it. And it's one of those things that makes Penny, you know, Alfred such a great character is that he has the strength of character that he would do it. But it's also part of things I would not want to be him. You know, it's, you know, every horrific thing, you know, that happens to uh, Batman also happens to Alfred and happens to Alfred at an nth level because he is the father figure. He is the character that is going to support Bruce throughout all of this trouble. But again, as I said before, Bruce is not the most, you know, open and trust. Yeah. I don't want to say trusting because he is trusting of Alfred, but he's emotionally is a bit reserved. So even as Alfred's trying to support him, there's going to be that, you know, that darkness that he's even going to cast to Bruce. And that's got to add to the, just the horrific, the horror of it. And you think back to how horrific, you know, it was for Bruce when Damien died, same level of just pain and anguish that Alfred was dealing with, but he also had Bruce to deal with. He also had Bruce. He had to keep going and, he doesn't know that Dick Grayson's still alive. So in his head, Dick Grayson's dead. You know, it's, you know, there's so many more, just this pain that's been mounted on Alfred that he's definitely the number one supporting character I would not want to be. All right, so my supporting characters that I wouldn't want to be. Uh, I started first with Terry Sloan, the original Adam, or at least the Earth 2 version of him right now. <laughs> I mean, talk about a guy. He's a, he was a traveler, it turns out, from another Earth and in his bargain, he basically is giving up other places <laughs> for that purpose. Um, I couldn't imagine being driven to the point where you would do something like this. You, you know, it's uh, uh, to be that disconnected from people, uh, to think you're that superior. And there was something about that character that I was just kind of like, ooh. Uh, and I, I don't consider – I consider him a supporting character. Um, it's It's tough in that book to – choose who really are considered main characters and supporting characters, but I do consider him like a background supporting character, but wow, does he bring a lot of story with him. Um, the more we learn about him, the more I actually revile him. He's a survivor uh, at the expense of anyone and everyone. 
uh, for his own goals and his own end. And he knows how to manipulate a situation so that it comes out to his advantage. And uh, th there's just, he's slimy. I mean, there's no other way about it. Um, you feel dirty talking about him, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> uh, which means that you certainly don't want to be him, much less that. Uh, my second one was, uh, and I, I'm going to butcher her name horribly, it's from Swamp Thing, Capucini? The one who lived forever. It's C-A-P-U-C-I-N-E. Uh, the one who lived forever, the immortal, you know, that ended up... Um, I, I actually adored the book Swamp Thing. I adored her as a character. I like that there's different kinds of immortals in fiction. There's the immortals that you want to be, that somehow there's a romanticism to it. And then there's her, <laughs> where she's this warrior who who did this as a way to kind of, uh, this was her quest, her, uh, her, in some ways, a way to atone. There was so much driving what she did that uh, you did not get this romantic feeling to the whole thing. You loved the character and her drive. But even when she was dying, it was like, like I want to die. I, I want to, I, I don't ever want to hit a point in my life where I'm sitting here going, and I hope I never do, where I'm like, I've had enough. I just want to die. And uh, there's something to that because there are moments where people get very sick and there's something going on with them that's a very real part of life. And I found her fascinating as a character because we got to see this journey that kind of went on too long for her. Yet she was surrounded by all this beauty in the Swamp Thing's world. There was something I found that was captivating about her and I did not want to be her at all. Uh, but yet I wanted to read about her. She's another one of those that like, I don't want to, but I want to read about her. I want to know her. I want to know more about her history. That book was one of my favorite books to come out of the new 52. And it was because of supporting characters like her that I wouldn't want to be necessarily uh, because this world, it kind of goes back to what you said about Justice League Dark and what we agreed on about that title. It's these are interesting characters to reading about, but their world is so creepy um, that even though it's the world of the green, the world is so creepy and filled with such uh, positives that are balanced out by great negatives that you wouldn't want to be them. And I loved the use of her as an immortal. I loved her skills. I found her fascinating, interesting. I did not want to be her, though, because of all the negatives that go along with being her. And I thought that that made her a far more interesting character. It's not easy being green. It is not easy being green. <laughs> My number one that I did not want to be was Vostok from the others, depending on which version of him we're talking about. <laughs> and that's what I loved about his story. There were four of them, and each one was given a very different background and put with different parents as an experiment. Their whole life was a lie. All of them. Every single one of them. And, you know, from being put through horrible things, horrid things, in order to uh, kind of set a, a baseline. Uh, it was, he was the one that was not supposed to be. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't supposed to work out that way. And I love, you find out that like everything you knew was a lie and you were just a lab rat. And there was something about that character because of it that I just found fascinating, but I certainly would not want to be that. Or it's, it's a, That's the bad side of adoption. And I was adopted, and I got the good side of it. I did not get the Vajtok side of it. <laughs> um, I just, I really loved that character and found it interesting. So all three of those characters, I think, were great characters to read about. But there were three characters I'm like, I would not want to be e any one of the three in a million years. Yeah, actually, I, I that, those were some those were some good calls on that one, especially the Vajtok one. I'm kicking myself for not for not thinking about him just because of, you know. Just everything that he went through. That's uh -huh. that's his tough one. <laughs> that was Aquaman and the Others was a terrific book. Very yeah. underrated. You don't hear it mentioned a lot. And I really dug that book a great deal because of interesting characters like Vashtok. Um I when the book kicked off, I was like, Really? They're spinning this into a series? And as the more I read it, the more I was like, Oh, I get it. <laughs> like, oh, what a great title to read about. Um, these characters are so unique and interesting. And uh, Vashtok was really stood out for me as being the one that I really greatly loved his story, but oh, I wouldn't want to go through that. <laughs> <laughs> Places you'd want to live, Jim. Places I would want to live. Um, my number three spot is Seattle. Which is actually kind of interesting because in the real world, I would want to live there as well. Um, it's a kind of a cool city. But I went with, you know, for this category, I went for with not places I would want to live as a hero. 
But as a person, cities, I, places I would want to live or places I would not want to live as a person. So that's the main thing to think about this. I'm not thinking of myself as a hero. I'm thinking of myself as a person. And Seattle 1 is a pretty cool city. And in the DC Universe, I really don't recall too much major massive destruction happening to Seattle. Yeah, they had their, you know, some crime stuff. They had some stuff going on. They got the arrow team arrow doing their thing and they've got the villains and there was some stuff, but there's no major aliens are invading and destroying our city or uh, Joker fear gas or all these type of craziness that you see in these other places that as a general rule, Seattle's a pretty cool place to live. I'm I'm kind of digging it. Granted, there are a lot of bridges there. So that does kind of put it on the, uh, you know, the spot I don't know about. But, you know, it's still a pretty great place to go. Um, my number two spot comes with the caveat that I am an Atlantean. I would definitely want to live in Atlantis. It's, you know, you look at just how, yeah, they've had their issues and they had their history and they've had a couple invasions and some stuff going on, some craziness there. But as a general rule, I think the fact that if I could breathe underwater and could live in the bottom of the ocean and do all the stuff that just the normal Atlanteans can do, that would make up for it because that would be really cool to do. And I think, you know, just being able to just, you know, just to swim out there in the ocean and do among the reefs and all that neat kind of what I think would be kind of a cool life to live, you know, just living under the sea. And no, I'm not going to sing the song from Little Mermaid under the sea, because if I start singing, I will start coughing again. And I'm trying to avoid that. But that life would be a kind of a neat thing for me. I think, you know, just looking at the the society that they did craft for it, it was actually a kind of a cool, you know, sort of society that you know, I would want to do and it's I don't know it was it just it had every time I read about it you know you'd see the people again I'd be one of those supporters of uh, Arthur and I'd be you know as I said that I created a supporting character that I would be hopefully that's the person I would be while I'm living there but I you know I just just living there I think would be kind of neat um the last place I would want to live yeah, you know, my number one spot is Mogo. You know, you just think about how cool it would be to live on a living planet that could modify things as you need it. And, you know, and and the Green Lantern Corps had civilian contractors there. A lot of them turned out to be Durlans and they were, ex, you know, you know, exported off the, the place and arrested. But some of them actually were legitimate, honest people. And that would be me. So I think that'd be kind of a cool job for me. I'm already right now kind of a, a support position for, you know, law enforcement with you know, financial crimes and anti-money laundering investigations. So I could see myself doing that on an intergalactic level, you know, working with the Green Lantern Corps. Wouldn't have a ring or maybe I would. I don't know how they deal with that, you know, but it's still, I think, just the fact of, you know, just how, you know, how neat I think it would be to live on Mogo, you know, just to be, you know, on that living planet. Granted, it's got its issues. We saw when when she lost her ring that, you know, the planet kind of quickly started dying and, you know, but the lanterns were there to get the, the people without rings off of it safely. So I don't think they had too high of body count. And there have been a couple invasions of Mogo, so that's kind of a tough thing. But Again, you do have a living planet defending you, so I I think I dig uh, living there. My places I would want to live were I started off first, uh, kind of taking a look at Swamp Things Home, the green, the lush beauty. One of the things that I really enjoyed about that series was the art and the fact that the green and even that mansion that they were living in and stuff like that. It was all so beautiful. And that stems from the fact that you've got Alec Holland being able to be in touch with all of that. And there's something, um, I I thought the design of the mansion with how, uh, you know, it had kind of that, uh, almost new Orleans style to it, you know, in the, it's more of an olden style mansion and, and all of the green and lush surrounding it just kind of, I don't know, there was something about it that just kind of struck me as like a really cool place. And I'm talking specifically their base of operations, even though it blew up, (laughs) (laughs) I'm pre blowing up is really what I was like, but I really loved the setting and the fact that in spite of these huge, great battles that he had and this darkness and the mystical, you know, horrors, that was like this place of comfort that uh, he could, there was a sense of normal there that was, I thought, very peaceful in a book that had a ton going on. So I really greatly enjoyed his home. Number two for me, Atlantis. Uh, I'm totally with you on your reasoning for Atlantis. Uh, I think think one of the things that I really like about it is I've always, as a kid, I always liked hiking. I liked exploring, you know, I would 
when my parents were divorced, I would spend half the week with my dad's, half the week at my mom's. When I was at my mom's, you know, a lot of times, a lot of my friends lived locally, you know, down by my dad's. So on the weekends, you know, there's a lot of times where I'd go to the library, I'd go hiking and stuff like that. Uh, the hiking part was really fun. I'd go to the local park, do a lot of hiking, exploring, try to find new nooks and crannies where you could go to. Um, Atlantis kind of takes me back to that, but with a more of a, a adult vastness, you know, in the sense that, wow, you can go anywhere now and every place is new. Uh, there's all kinds of unique explorations and different places you could go to. So I'm not just talking about Atlantis proper. I'm talking about everything surrounding it. The fact that you could live in, in the, beauty, the beauty and majesty that is Atlantis, but there's so much to see outside of it that would be cool and interesting and all that. And with the caveat being like you, I would have some way to comfortably breathe <laughs> where, where I wouldn't feel like I'm claustrophobic. Because the, the vast openness really is, to me, it's not a claustrophobic thing. It's the ability to explore that vast openness that I really am fascinated by. Number one to me, I really thought about, I'm like, what is the one place in the DC universe where I'm like, it just feels like there's hope there. And it would be like an uplifting place to live. And that would be Flash's home. You know, the Keystone, Central City kind of uh, thing that, that goes on there. I didn't represent enough on this episode how much I'm digging the Flash. And it, this was really the perfect place to do it because the Flash, there's a whole vibe. No matter how dark things get in the Flash's world, there's a sense of hope and normalcy in the Flash's home. That's the place where you want to see the hero because you know that like, even if there's some crazy crime or something going on, it's like a cool, like taking a snapshot TMZ kind of moment where you want to be a part of the hubbub. And you know, if you run into the flash, he's going to be super cool to you. And you know, you can probably get an autograph or something cool like that. You know I mean? Like, and it, there'd be like a real acknowledgement of you that would just be kind of neat, uh, where you would have stories with the friends. You could we met the flash and how cool was that? And, uh, there's something about that whole town that there's just an interesting, cool vibe to it because of, of that. You know, everyone would have a Flash story, but everyone's Flash story is unique and different. And he'd be a character that you'd see zooping around a lot because of the fact that he goes on patrol and he's so fast. You know, you'd see him or, or try to figure out if you just saw him with the fact that a blur just went by. I just really find Central City, Keystone City fascinating in how, uh, how it's crafted. So that would be easily my number one place. I just I think that the book has done a great job of even when there's bad things going on, there's a hope to it. It, a lot of it goes back to harkens back to what you were saying about Saint Walker earlier. Yeah, um, that kind of hope makes you go, I could live here, and I could like that would be a spot where uh, it's probably the most like what I like about my life now, and I could actually genuinely see myself living there, which is uh, it, it, there's a connectability there that I think is interesting. Yeah, I dig Central City. That was actually an honorable mention for me, and you know everything you acute what you said about just the Flash is kind of neat. You know, but they did have a high death and destruction rate, you know, mm -hmm. this past year. And that was the thing that kept it off of my top three. But it's funny because, yeah, but then you see just the rapid repair work. You see just a city bouncing back quickly. You know, and part of that is because the Flash is such a positive hero. So there's there is a lot of plus and minuses on Central City. Places I would not want to live. I have utmost respect and admiration for the farmers of this uh, of America. That is a very difficult job, very low pay, very low rewards. It's not flashy. It's not, you know, famous, but it's very tough. And so even though I'm saying that the one place, the number three place I would not <laughs> want to live is Smallville. Um, yeah, it's kind of neat. It's the birthplace of Superman. But, you know, like Cleveland, it's a difficult place to live. Um, plus, you add to it, how many alien invasions have we had in Smallville? How many times has that been the focal point of some nasty death and destruction, mostly because of Superman was from there? There's just a lot of negative stuff going along with a hard, even if you didn't have the negative stuff, you still got a tough life. So, I'm, yeah, my number three spot is uh, Smallville. Again, yeah, I yeah, feel bad saying that because, you know, you know, my connection to Superman, but I got to deal with, I got to be honest here as a person, I would not want to live there. Now, my number two spot, once again, is very difficult for me to say, considering how much I love Superman, but 
As a person, I would not live in Metropolis for a lot of the stuff I mentioned about Smallville just because of how many times has that place been invaded, how many times has a city been massively destroyed, massive death, destruction, you name it. Metropolis is usually the focal point for a lot of death and destruction, a lot of hostile craziness that I don't think um, – yeah, I, I, it's, it'd be cool to be able to maybe one time look above and see Superman fly overhead or, cause it is that great big broad city that, you know, is amazing that everybody, you know, it's that the city of tomorrow, the city of the future. And there'd, there'd be some really cool stuff living there. But for me, I think, you know, first alien invasion, first time, you know, I'm stuck inside a bottle or first time I'm, my mind's taken over by Brainiac or any of the, any of the negative craziness that happens there. I'm moving. I'm like, <laughs> I'm, see ya. I'm going to some place where it's safer. Keeping with the mindset of moving someplace safer, the number one spot I would not live. And I don't think this will be a surprise to anybody is Gotham. <laughs> I, I've said on multiple times, no way I would ever live there. You figure considering you know, what I do, I would be working with police. I would be doing that type of stuff. no. No, not in Gotham. Even if I was a normal, everyday, just average banker, not doing anything crazy, the last place I would want to be a banker is in Gotham because who knows what craziness the Joker or Penguin or Two-Face or Clayface, who knows what's going to happen with fear toxins being pumped on or cities being burst into flames or uh, Spectre rising up and judging you. There's so much craziness, so much ungodliness that happens in Gotham. And happens to the everyday people that the highest body count of any civilians in any comic book happens in Gotham. No way you would ever catch me living there. My number three is Themyscira. That place cannot catch a break. <laughs> <laughs> um, also if, tough on guys. <laughs> yeah, if you're yeah, if you're not turned into clay, you're ready to start a war um, or to be a part of a war. And uh, there is there's no peace in Themyscira. You do not move to a war zone. <laughs> you just don't. <laughs> I love it. I love the um, interesting parts. And it's funny. Everything that I said about Atlantis as far as wanting to explore Atlantis and stuff like that, I could see myself wanting to explore Themyscira. There's just no way you can do that without potentially getting an arrow or stabbed or whatever. Uh, it's too much day or turned into clay. Um, you know, And I don't want to be Gumby. So uh, it's it really is uh, one of those places that I wouldn't want to be. Gotham, uh, I kind of ditto everything that you said. Uh, I, I, here's the funny part. I said I want to be Batman's sidekick or want to be, you know, a, a Penny Two and stuff like that. Uh, very much that revolves being in the Cat Bat Cave or being behind the wheel of some form of vehicle with lots of protection in it. Um, I would like to play Gotham like a video game if I lived there. In the sense that I'm not walking the streets, I'm shooting bad guys who are on the streets. <laughs> <laughs> In some form of bat contraption that would benefit me. Um, you know, that like the idea of driving through the streets in the tumbler appeals to me. Uh, that does appeal to me. Living there and actually like going to the movies and stuff like that, not so much. Um, you know, so there's, uh, I, I stand behind everything I said earlier about being a sidekick there, but mm, living there, not so much. The number one that was kind of an easy one for me, it's earth two. And, and I mean the whole planet. <laughs> um, I hear the real estate's real cheap and they've got a heck of a movie sale going on right now, but, uh, it's not for me <laughs> when your planet's being destroyed. <laughs> yeah. Yes. When your planet's being destroyed and all and turned into a new apocalypse, not the place that you want to live right now. I And honestly, all three of these I picked, I've kind of my theme, if if you're catching on, has, has been what things stood out for me in storytelling this year when I approached each of these categories. And those were three places that I thought really were well-developed this year as having huge happenings in them that influenced this decision. I feel this way because of what happened in those places this year. Next year, Themyscira might jump back up on the scale as maybe being a place I want to visit. At the moment? No. <laughs> no. I'm still debating over Gotham or Earth 2. You know? mm -hmm. I'm still debating. I may want to go Earth 2 over Gotham. <laughs> No, no, because like <laughs> there's there's an inherent problem with that. Um, you, you've seen Dark Side and the Parademons and stuff like that. 
um, there's still if you're well, although in an apocalypse you could see Batman pair. <laughs> That's a possibility because he does do that. He's he's known to chase his son down there, yeah. but uh, I, I think uh, the Batman appearances would be enough to keep Gotham number two for me, um, or or some member of the Bat family. So, on that note, Jim, our our last two major categories are heroic moment and villainous moment. What were your heroic moments? See, with heroic moment this year, I didn't want to go with the da 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 big broad moments. Mm-hmm. I kind of went with. Something more on a smaller scale, not my typical. What I normally, I, I'm normally a dun da da kind of guy, and I wanted. I, I was digging through some stuff and trying to find something that I, I don't want to say smaller scale because to me these were very, really huge moments. They, every single one of them made me say, "Dang, that's cooler!" Whoa! Or, oh my god! And had that that emotional reaction from yeah. me, you know. And it wasn't just something cool looking, but something I was like, "Wow." So it's that's kind of where I'm heading at with this. And I've been bouncing order of these things around, and I think I finally have my final order here. And um, my number three spot goes to Zatanna. Now, it's back in uh, Justice League Dark when House of Mystery and House of Wonder are merging, and the whole universe is about to die, and everything's about to destroy. The world, you know, the universe as we know it's about to be destroyed, standard for Justice League Dark. And the only way to break this up is because of the connection between Zatanna and John Constantine, their love. And they have to cast a spell that sacrifices that love. But it's not just sacrificing that love. It's taking it so that everybody in the universe will not really know how these two felt except for one person. And Zatanna had to be that one person who would know the truth, who would know that John Constantine actually deeply loved her and she actually deeply loved him. And nobody else will know this. Nobody else would pretty much believe it. Even Constantine won't know this. And he even showed him thing. eh, he just thought, right, yeah, she's not really my type. Yeah, we had some fun, but not really my type. You know, with was a huge change because he really deeply and truly loved her. And the fact that she's able to give up this, able to give up that love. You know, we've all had those moments where in our life where we were head over heels for somebody and we find out, I just think of you as a brother or, yeah, I just like you as a friend. And this, you get that moment where it just cuts you and you're just like, oh, you know, she's got it to the umpteenth level. The fact that everybody around her won't know the truth. The person she was in love with won't know the truth. She and she alone have to bear this on her. And she goes ahead and does it. And that was just, it was one of those things that I was like, oh, that's, that's a tough one. Because it, 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 we, we didn't talk about it a lot and we didn't give it a lot of press. And I didn't really see too much on it on the net even. But it was one of those things that you really affected her. And you see it throughout, you know, throughout to the end of Justice League Dark, how much it really just hit her and hurt her. And she dealt with it. I was like, whoa, that's, that, that was a cool kind of just, dang kind of moment that I was like, that for me is just a heroic moment that she's like, Hey, I got to You got to do what you got to do. This is it. She made the sacrifice. And I, I, I just really just, you know, was impressed by that. My number two moment, it comes from our buddy, Dick Grayson with his trudge through the, uh, the desert. Yeah. You know, again, not a flashy moment. He just kept that ongoing constant thing. And I love the fact that it, you know, you, cause you referred to it earlier. He's one of the reasons He's the guy you wanted to be, the guy you want to hang with, that guy you want to have as a partner, and just that continuing pushing through. You know, just that it's it's not about, you know, it's about this little baby, saving this little baby. It's not just about keeping the baby out of the hands of Spiral. It's about saving that life. It's about pushing through. It's about doing the impossible, surviving as long as he did in the desert with what little he had, just to keep going. It's that march or die mindset where it's this, it's that beyond heroic gut check level of, I cannot stop. I will not stop. I cannot fail. And it's that's the true hero moment. That is, you know, it's something that we could all aspire to be more like. We can, you know, we as a, and I'm talking we as a general concept of humanity where you can push beyond just to save that innocent life, just push beyond for that greater good. And that's just that it really impressed me. And it was something that I was like, wow, that that's a really cool moment. Um, my last and final heroic moment 
comes from Carlos Chuck Gutierrez. Now, for those of you who do not know who this is, he was in um, the Superman story where we got to see our the Superman's version of the Joker. Carlos was a um, un, was a laid off uh, web designer who used to go on the weekends, dress up in a Superman costume, and go to a children's hospital. And he would go there to entertain these sick and dying kids. As and he, he didn't look like Superman, but it was still one of those things where he volunteered. And this guy gets shot by an untraceable bullet right in front of these children. And he could have very easily just dropped to the ground right there. And then, But the, he had the, the mindset to not only cover up the wounds so they wouldn't see the blood, but walk out of the room so Superman didn't die in front of these kids. This is not a superhero. This is not anybody who had any training of the bat or anything like that. He was just an everyday average guy who recognized, I am about to die right now. I am not going to die in front of these children. And that, to me, was just this huge, huge moment that I was like, whoa. That that hit me like you would not believe when I was reading that issue. So when I was reading, just going through it, I thought that the whole bat, the, the Superman's Joker was a great story. But just that moment of, and you know, just that level of, commitment that just everyday normal person had you know i'm like you know what yeah because it was funny because he first started off as my my number he started off as an honorable mention for me you know and then he became my number three then i started thinking more about it like you know this to me is you know massive you know this little person small scale doing just this massive heroic moment and it Again, it wasn't anything that made major press that didn't get any type of even comments, you know, major comments from us. But it was still something that just every time I keep thinking, I keep going back to this moment where I'm like, you know what? This guy is awesome. I got to. So it's it was one of those things that I just I had to give him, you know, full props on it. It's it's weird for me saying heroic moment is going to a non superhero. But for some reason, that just those moments just it. It touched me. And I was just like, I got a genuine, honest, emotional reaction just because it's the everyday person rising up and doing something that is beyond, you know, what you would expect from a normal person. And I was just like, wow, that's cool. My number three is kind of of a similar vein. It was the girl who gave the cat, who gave Catman the cat. Now, here's why it's heroic. We know what her boss was like. Like, we knew what that dude would do as far as, you know, how vicious he was and, and like, how he tortured Catman and, and everything that he did. And he was imprisoning him for a year to make a point. You know that's who your boss is and what he's doing. I don't think you're going to start crossing a line of saying, hey, because by giving him the cat, not only was it an act of kindness, but it was basically showing him, I think what he's doing to you is wrong. You know, the, the depth that he's going to. To make that stand in that place is a really bad move, but there was something heroic about it. She did it out of compassion and to have compassion and to act on it. There's a difference between the two. You can have compassion and go home and say, boy, you know, how was your day at work, honey? Well, I got to tell you, the boss is kind of going over the edge a bit at work, (laughs) but I'm afraid to do anything about it instead of coming back with a kitten. Um, I just thought that was like one of those things where it shows how well developed the villain was that I actually thought her, thing her situation was so much more heroic because of the fact that we know how nasty her <laughs> boss is uh that that she made the decision to to do that uh, knowing that this guy's probably going to have some consequences number 2 for me was batman's rescue of damien you went to basically a version of hell uh your son's dead yet there's this part of you that firmly believes because of things that you've seen that if you use this shard there's a really good possibility you can bring your kid back. You're going into a place where the suit that you're wearing is likely going to be the only thing that will keep you alive uh, because you know you're going up against the, a very, very dangerous enemy. The the heroic nature of that whole end battle to get his son back and the fact that he wouldn't quit and the fact that he flew in f- the face of Darkseid. We've seen Batman fight Darkseid before in the previous continuity. And it was a Darkseid who... I'm talking about in the uh, the old uh, Superman Batman book. Uh, it was a dark side who, because of the gauntlets Batman were or because of the stuff that Batman was wearing, Batman was able to like go to toe to toe with him, which really should not happen with Batman. 
And in this case, I also thought it felt like that. I felt like Batman was using the suit that he was wearing as a way to buy himself time to do the things that he needed to do. I really loved how that all played out. He used it like a, you know, he used Darkseid's power basically against him in this one to accomplish his own goals. Uh, and, And with a realization that he might not live this. When he got back and we saw him collapse because of what he'd been through, I think that said a lot. So I thought it was a story that was framed and made that moment more heroic to me. I'm a big fan of a parent that will you know, put it all on the line for their kid. And I just thought that, that worked really well. My number one moment was Grayson in the desert with the child. Here's why it worked. Such, it stood out for me as an event where that issue, from beginning to end, you had this sense of the vastness of the desert. It was never ending. You're not seeing any sign of civilization yet you're trudging on in hope that you're going to make it to that civilization and because you've got this baby that's your responsibility. He was going through everything the other two were, with the exception of, you know, when Helena obviously had a had another issue that she was going through. But, you know, Midnighter was going through the same thing as him and couldn't press on the same way that Dick Grayson did because Dick Grayson just has a different sort of drive when it comes to rescuing and protecting others. And you saw it here with him and this child. I just thought it was just such a great issue from start to finish. And you were rooting for him the whole way. And I love that it all happened in real time. You didn't do it in five panels. You did it through most of the issue. And that journey meant more because of the way they did it through most of the issue. I just thought it was really one of the cooler heroic moments this year. And it just made me love uh, the book Grayson even more. I just thought it was really just a well-handled moment. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, I know. That was... You know, it is funny you talk about with the the Batman going into the breach. That was originally on my list, but you know, when I did my shifting, so I agree with you how cool that was. Just you know the 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 determined father going into the gates of hell just to rescue his son. I think that yeah that again that was another one that I was like that was an awesome moment. Villainous, villainous moments. Now I kind of I, I approach villainous moments a little differently, obviously, than I did heroic moments and. I tried to pick, you know, just a try to get it to a single just moment or a single line or just a single action. And I didn't I, I said to myself, I wasn't going to do the same villain for all three moments. I was going to intentionally go. So pick, you know, what I thought was, you know, either the worst or coolest or however moment. So my number three goes to the Joker and it's hello, Bruce. Right after he deals with Gordon, he's on the mic with Batman. It's that moment where he lets Bruce Wayne know, yes, I know you're Batman. Everything you've been afraid of is true. Everything you were worried about is true. It was it's beyond just, yeah, he's he's raining the you know, fear toxins. He's doing all types of crazy stuff. Later on, he's chopping hands, he's doing all types of nasty stuff. But just that one moment, just those two words were just really that great villainous moment that says, yes, I know I win. And it kind of goes along with what you said about him saying he had the best year because, yeah, he had, you know, this absolutely beautiful year where he completely strung Bruce along. And right there, that's the one of the moments, the one of the key moments, letting Bruce know exactly how deep the Joker is with him, how deep this goes and how far Bruce didn't see it coming because he really throughout the whole argument. Does he know? Does he not know? Does he right there flat out? You know, first fact, he knows the truth. And for me, that was just an absolutely just wonderful, wonderful Joker moment that I'm like, because it was tough for me picking a single Joker moment, but that for me was just an absolutely wonderful moment. Now, by number two comes, you know, it's a Lincoln March and or Thomas Wayne Jr., whatever name he's going by, whoever he actually is, when he kills the Clue Master. I absolutely loved that moment. It was an absolutely perfect villainous thing to do. 
Clue Master gave all these, you know, everything you said about the Clue Master, how he would have had the best year, but he had the worst year because of this that one moment. It's because of that one moment that I'm like, man, that is an absolutely beautiful, wonderful, villainous moment just because, you know, Clue Master did the impossible. Clue Master beat Batman. And not only did he beat Batman, he beat Batman without knowing the secret identity. So he didn't beat Bruce Wayne. He beat Batman. He laid out this massive, intricate plan. He threw out all the villains at him, going, hey, you guys do your thing, giving them clues, giving them, you know, their tools, everything. That was a perfect thing. Only problem is one of the villains decided, eh, my plan isn't to try to kill the Batman, it's to kill you. And then I'll kill Batman. Or that we don't know exactly what his plan or not. I'm assuming he's doing this so he can kill Batman, you know, himself and not let Clue Master get the credit for it. But again, it's for me just that single moment because it was the sheer shock, the awe of, oh my God, I didn't see that coming. Holy crud. And it's, it's funny because it just has this, it really hit me. I was like, wow, that is a really awesome, just awesome villainous, awesome death, just this absolutely amazing moment I didn't see coming that, yeah, I was excited for. Now, my number one villainous moment, again, is because it just, just it really affected me. It this These moments deeply affected me to the point where the sacrifice of the hero became my number one, the death leading up to it became my number one villainous moment. I am talking about Shadow King killing Carlos Chuck Gutierrez. And it's not just about the fact that he kills this guy dressed up as Superman just to look like, just because he's looking like Superman, but he's killing him in front of these children inside a hospital. It's beyond evil level of holy crud, but he's doing the whole thing just because he's wearing the red ass, just because he's trying to live up to just that that positive image that Superman has. He's trying to do what's good. He's trying to do what's right. He's trying to do what everyone, we want people to do. We want Superman to inspire people. We want to say that's the kind of leader that Superman is, that he inspires people to step up and do the right thing. And that's what Chuck was doing. And that's what got Chuck killed. And that's why Shadow King targeted him because of all those goodness and all that wonderfulness that he's doing he's gonna make sure it hurts he's gonna make sure this is something that's gonna really stick it to superman this isn't batman i'm killing this isn't lois lane this isn't somebody in the business this is an individual an unknown person oh yeah and let me use a you know a kryptonian as the bullet you know let's you know actually add to the level of insult and injury that i'm using his own people as the actual weapon against him and i was just like it was just to me just this absolutely truly evil villainous moment that i was like you know what i gotta go with this so my villainous moments i i kind of went for emotional resonance and it sounds like we approached it the same way we wound up with different conclusions but that's a personal journey and i think with all this i, I kind of went for that what were my as i was looking at the category what were some personal emotional connections i had with the story so my number three was bar to turning on earth I was so rooting for her. I thought like, you know, and, and where they swerved me, I was thinking, you know, the typical Mr. Miracle Barda team up and all that was going to go on down. And then all of a sudden she turned on them and I didn't see it coming. And I liked that. Uh, it was very villainous because then, you know, she started like, not only did she turn on them, but she was, you know, leading the charge and, you know, it was, it was an act of cowardice. It was in, then there was viciousness surrounding it. And, uh, it was, there was something about that, that I thought was really cool in the way that it was handled. I still keep expecting that at some point we're going to get her being a double agent or something like that. But for me right now, as it stands, it's the villainous moment. Yeah. Number two for me was just in the way that it went down, Constantine killing Constantine. You're looking at yourself and like the ideal better person, the better version of yourself. You're looking at the people surrounding him. It's your people you've lost. You know what they're going to think of you if you do this, yet you kill him anyway. And he killed him for the purpose of escaping, escaping with them. Even though that really that version of him was sacrificing himself to that anyway. So that way, those that he loved got away to be that scummy. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> um, in that moment, it was, uh, it was a really ruthless, villainous moment. And John knows it and John's scarred by it. And it's what makes John the person that we like reading about. 
It's what makes him at times unlikable, though, which is also what we like reading about with him. Yet, you can go to the other extreme. It's moments like that that it's kind of like, oh boy, this is why he has burnt a ton of bridges over time. And that emotional connection to me, I was like, oh. The, again, the internal dialogue during all of that, matched with the external dialogue, really made that whole sequence work and is a great example of great writing that it really stood out for me. Number one was the biggest surprise. Uh, Alfred's hand getting cut off by the Joker. I was like, did they just do that? And how could you do that? It's Alfred. I was angry. I was angry at the Joker that that happened. Uh, and, and that's where you've really taken me somewhere in a story when you did that. It wasn't just done for shock value. It was done to really elevate the Joker, which it's funny to say that, but it did. It put the Joker on a whole different level. And it's in his story where it made sense to do it. And it was woof, it was the moment that stood out for me is probably because it's such a major character to do that with. Uh, that part really stood out for me as, as one of the uh, the top villainous moments. Jim, did you have anything for honorable mention? Actually, I limited myself to three in that too, but you don't have to. We didn't we didn't go crazy on that one. What did you come up with for some honorable mentions? Because uh, we'll use that to kind of wrap up this segment. Well, I've mostly been mentioning them throughout it when okay. I did honorable uh, mention for the different categories. Okay, so you, was there anything else that you that you had that you didn't say? There is one. Go for it. Yeah, when we were talking about teams, I wanted to say Teen Titans, uh -huh. but I felt kind of creepy considering I'm 40, uh, 44 years old. How can I say I want to be part of a teen book, you know, part of a teen you know, team, you know? I'd be that creepy old guy, you know, on the team with a bunch of teenagers. I think that'd be kind of a bit, a little bit weird on my end. But it was always a team that I always thought was a really cool dynamic and a really cool – you know, just, you know, the characters were just these amazing characters that I would want to be a part of them, but I, I shouldn't be. <laughs> I love that we can use that to maybe continue fleshing out that supporting characters that doesn't exist. Exactly. He could be the creepy <laughs> old guy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um some of my honorable mentions were uh, things like uh, the New 52 is a concept because it's coming to an end. And when I say it's coming to an end, the, the continuity is going to be continuing, it looks like. But the the connected concept of the new 52 the way that they've been doing all of these books as a part of that as a whole it's coming to an end I, I wanted to shout it out as an honorable mention because i've really enjoyed it i think the new 52 is a great bold experiment and that's not to say they hit a home run with everything they didn't there's some things that worked incredibly well there's some things that didn't work and uh, you know they may have worked for me but they fizzled you know ultimately they didn't get the readership that they were looking for in certain books um, I love the experimentation of it. I love that they tried titles and concepts that they haven't tried for a while. I like that they tried them and um, g gave them a certain life and then tried a new concept and, and kept doing that along the way. I think it is, it's in that end, it's been a successful journey because we got books like Animal Man. We got books like Swamp Thing. We got books like Captain Adam. Uh, there was a lot of great experimentation that came out of this and continues to come out of it. Uh, we got the return of books like Secret Six and, and things like that. You know, I, I'm just anxious to see where they're going to go. I'm really glad that spinning out of Convergence, that experimentation is continuing. Not every one of those books is going to be a hit or a home run, but boy, on paper, they look really, really good. Hey, speaking of that, you know, this is a side tangent. Did you see that who Batman Beyond is likely going to be? No, I haven't. There is a new Batman Beyond. Ooh. And I will say this, and I'll, I'll leave it at this. It's not the one in the new 52 Futures End right now. And I'll leave it at that. Because uh, I, I don't want to spoil that story. Now I'm going to have to jump on the internet and see what it is. <laughs> um, but... But I'm excited for that. And we were we were talking about our interest in the books post convergence, and that's why I'm mentioning that. I'm very interested in Batman Beyond now. I was interested before. Now I'm even more interested. Yeah, I hope they keep going with uh, trying different stuff. You know, they're, they're, they've the, some of the line out they've thrown. They're they're not giving up on that. You know, concept of let's let's try something. Let's see what happens. And you know, and I hope people can give you know different titles a shot and see what's out there. Because that, that, for me, I agree with you, was one of the cool stuff when they did these titles like, ah, do I really want to, what's this? Do I really want to read that? Next thing I know, I'm like, oh, my God, this is great. You know, so it's, yeah, it's, I'm looking forward to seeing what the change is going to be like and seeing what the, uh, what the journey is going to happen now. 
Yeah, th- that is balanced to my reading, and I'm excited for that. My number two uh, honorable mention was uh, Vertigo. Um, I wanted to shout that out over the past year, just seeing something that I thought was really interesting. Books like Wolf Moon, Sandman Overture, of Continuing Loving Fables, um, FBP. I'm getting caught up on that book and really digging it. The Vertigo Quarterly, I mentioned on the show multiple times. Vertigo as a concept um, has delivered really good stuff, but those are some books just off the top of my head that I was really digging this year. And uh, Gail Simone's going to be getting a creator-owned Vertigo series. Not many series, ongoing this year. Ooh. She's got one that uh, she's going to be doing. I, I forget, I'm drawing a blank on the name right now. I just saw it yesterday that that's going to be coming up, but I'm really, really excited to read that. It's it's another Gail book. It's a monthly. Um, I'm anxious to see what she does, and it's her first ongoing from Vertigo, so uh, I think that's going to be really neat, and the fact that I like the fact that it's creator-owned. I want to see what she's going to do with it. I've enjoyed her previous um, creative creative owned offerings and i'd like to see what she does with this one i'm, I'm super excited I'm, I'm a big fan so i'm geeking out the third thing i wanted to shout out and this will be my final one is dc tv and uh, i'd be remiss if we didn't talk about uh you know if we're doing raging Oscars and talking about concepts over the last year dc tv as a concept's been great uh, i don't know if you've seen i zombie yet i watched the first two episodes i'm really loving it constantine arrow the flash gotham all those shows just really been great each one unique in its own right. Really enjoyed the DC TV output. I'm excited for more over the next coming year uh, just to see where they're going. I love the idea of the Adam spinoff and things like that that's going. I just want to see Preacher's going to be coming, and I'm really excited about that. So I'm glad to see more properties from DC winding up in the television medium because they've been really doing very well with them so far with the ones that they've got. So DC TV is something I just wanted to shout out in general as a concept. And that's it for my, I kept myself okay. to three honorable mentions and I wanted to leave it that way. But those are three things that didn't fit into our categories above, uh, but that I wanted to just shout out as part of the Oscars as being concepts that I really dug over this past year. Good stuff. Outstanding. And I echo, echo let me echo what, what you're saying about the DC TV. Cause that's something that I've really, yeah, I know we've had a couple episodes on it, and it, it, with my past sickness, I haven't been able to watch. I've gotten behind, so I started having some blocks of TV watching where I'm just sitting there, you know, kind of like cuddled and, you know, trying to get better at just watching, you know, episode after episode. I'm finding myself going, hoorah, jeering and hacking, and then I kill and I'm like, ugh, just holding, trying to hold it together. But, yeah, there's been some... Flash has had some amazing moments this past year, and I'm like, wow, I'm, I'm so such a Flash fan that a lot of my excitement for, and same thing with Arrow, a lot of my excitement that I have in the from the books are crossing over to the TV and vice versa. So it's it's kind of a neat thing that you know it's a different story, but it feels true to what I'm reading. So it's it's a great uh, a great interpretation of them. Anyway, I hope everyone enjoyed this. Uh, this was uh, kind of a fun concept. I remember when Jim pitched it to me as kind of an idea for how we do the Astros a little differently this year, I got really into it because I liked the idea of limiting ourselves, but also going concept-based because we haven't really done something like this with the Oscars. And it was kind of a good way to honor what we enjoyed in reading this year and through being able to talk about it and, and, and what stood out for us and what we remembered from what we read from the year that really stood out and, and was of note. Uh, it's been, I think it's been a great year of comics. I had a tough time pinning down on any category to three. Uh, and it's a testament to the quality of reading that was out there this past year. There was just a lot of really great stuff going on and it was fun to be able to kind of use this as a way to talk about some things either that we already talked about on the show and gave a lot of lip service to and some things that we didn't or maybe we talked about briefly and, and needed to have another conversation about a kind of a good way to capstone the year as we head into convergence next week's episode we will be talking about convergence we're going to start a kickoff of convergence and the final weeks of the weekly the, the final issues i should say of the the weekly books so that'll be our our episode next week but a uh, good conversation and jim great idea yeah, this one went well, and I was the only one who cheated this time, not you. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying. Look at those strange little beetles. They look great neutron. Hey there, Sean and Jim. It is Ian calling to wish you guys a happy nine-year anniversary. Holy crap at it being nine years already. 
time flies when you're having fun and you're reading good comics, right? Am I right? Am I right? Am I right? Eh, 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 eh. Eh, you know I'm right. Uh, just, uh, yeah, here's to many, many more years to come and uh, hope to talk X-Men with you guys soon. Let's get this going. Let's make this happen. I want to see what Jim's read and uh, and we'll get, we'll get going on this. And you'll be happy to know that I am indeed picking up a bunch of the Convergence titles so uh, even though I'm not exactly too keen on DC right now, they do still have me in one way or the other. Uh, yet again, here's to nine years, my friends, and uh, I'll hope to talk to you soon. Take it easy. Bye. It's funny. Uh, historically, uh, if, if you've been a long-time listener to the show, uh, you've, you've heard us either on Comic Timing or you've heard uh, Ian on our show. Uh, Ian is a longtime friend, and honestly, I wouldn't be podcasting if it wasn't for Ian. Uh, I've referenced many times uh, Comic Geek Speak and the relationships I built from going to uh, Comic Geek Speak's at anniversary shows, and that's what kind of what got me podcasting was listening to that show. I had the good fortune at uh, their first uh, big event to meet Ian Levenstein, and Ian was doing Geek Speak at the time. And he invited me on for a cartoon episode that he was doing, and it went. It was one of those that went an epic amount of time. We were talking about classic Saturday morning cartoons, and it it really opened a door for me as far as like how I wanted to podcast, how I wanted to geek out about things that I was enjoying. And uh, there wouldn't be a Raging Bolts if it wasn't for uh, the friendship of Ian Levenstein and, and getting me on this path. And uh, we've we've had a, a great many cross over episode recordings with comic timing over the years and uh, Ian certainly has been a big part of why Raging Bullets has been around so it's kind of it's very fitting on our, our ninth anniversary to talk about Ian and and the fact that uh, he really helped set us on this path and I know we we talked about last time we were on his show doing an X-Men related episode uh, you have I'm sure you've had no time to be able to read I know how behind you've gotten on a bunch of your reading to be able to read any of the X-Men books to even <laughs> think about yeah, doing I'm, that I'm, it, we would be on the episode if it wasn't for me I, mm-hmm. I gotta take the heat on this one i have not done any of the reading and it's i'm i'm trying to get i'm getting caught up on the dc stuff right before convergence right now and i've been just sick and dying for a while now and i'm trying to get back and get better and move forward so i I I desperately want to talk some X stuff. I want to pull out the books. I've got them sitting right here in my office. And, you know, eventually I will get to them and we will do it and we will let you all know about it. And it will be a fun time because, you know, Ian is my ambassador of Quan. So, you know, it's definitely uh, good to have him on the show and hang with him. If you haven't had a chance to listen to Comic Timing, though, I, I really, and it'll be in the show notes, I really encourage you to listen to it. Comic Timing is a great podcast, and uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention it. And this, But thanks, Ian, for the phone call. It's uh, Your timing, is, as speaking of timing, <laughs> is always excellent. <laughs> so um, just wanted to shout him out. And actually, uh, Jim, uh, it's a good time to mention, uh, thank you for recording with us today, because uh, I know you've been sick uh, the past... It's been like three weeks now that you've been uh, fighting something that's that's come on in waves. You had a big wave of the first go around on it, and then it's uh, transformed into something else. And it just really just has not gone away from you. Yeah, I went from f- the flu to bronchitis to uh, upper ear infection. It, as we're recording right now, my one ear rings constantly, and the other ear is completely plugged up. So it's it's the absolute bizarre sound inside my head. And unfortunately, it's also because of the bronchitis has really affected how much I can speak, and it's affected my singing. Which I, there's so many been multiple times when I've wanted to sing on this episode the past couple and I haven't been able to because I know it'll send me out a hacking fit. So I know there's a lot of people out there who are missing the songs. You know, it, it, I'll get better. Don't worry. It'll I'll come back with force. It's funny um, when I'm done recording and you've been finished singing people ask me how you're feeling and i'll mention the ringing in my head so it's, <laughs> it's i'm i'm connecting with you right now <laughs> yeah it- Sorry, <laughs> couldn't resist. You, you gotta, gotta, gotta like, lay, you gotta like, <laughs> lay it out for me. <laughs> No, so, uh, all joking aside out of it, though, um, Jim and I have been doing this together for nine years. And, uh, you know, I, I, I poke and tease at times on the podcast of Jim. But uh, honestly, 
uh, I can't imagine having done this show with anybody else. You were the first person I asked for a reason. Um, even back when, you know, my original concept was doing a rotating cast because I didn't think that um, anybody would want to do this as often as I wanted to. And uh, I, I was thrilled after our first recording. It just felt right, um, which I wasn't surprised with it being you. Um, I have really enjoyed doing this podcast for nine years with you and still get excited for every recording doing this podcast with you because of the unique opinion you bring to the table. It's, it's always fun for as long as I've known you to, that you surprise me with the things that we have in common but also the, the way you see things differently than I do. And it makes it fun to record this podcast and to, to talk comics with you because of the fact that you have a genuine passion for it now, but it comes from a very different angle from your experiences and all that, which I happen to greatly, for all my joking on this show, I happen to greatly respect. So I want to thank you for the last nine years doing this podcast for me and, and with me and, and keeping it so fun to do this podcast because I really genuinely could not imagine doing this with anybody else. Amen, man. You know, it's I, every year when we do this, I always just say that, I, you know, people, I don't know if everyone realizes just how much this show really means to me and just how grateful I am that we're doing this and that you're a part of it. And then that, you know, this is me hanging out with my friend and just talking about comics and just having fun and being stupid sometimes and <laughs> being serious other times and just you know it, it's just it's a, just this absolute wonderful just experience that I deeply and truly not only love but need I I I don't know what I would do without this show because it's just it's just it's Beyond just the comic reading, you know, the comic reading is wonderful and fun, you know, and I enjoy doing that. But there's just always something like when I'm reading a book, I'll set aside, like, we got to make sure we talk about that. So that'll be awesome. Okay? And it'll be times when in my head I've got pictured how I, I, I'll actually think how a conversation is going to go. And sometimes it goes that way. Sometimes it goes a completely different route. You know, and those are always just the wonderful thing where I'm like, where the heck did Sean pull that one from? <laughs> you know, and it's just these, you know, just sometimes that just, it's that surprise and that shock and that fun. And just, there's just so much from this that I absolutely love that, you know, and you got this whole thing started, man. If it wasn't for if it wasn't for you saying, "Hey, I'm thinking about doing this," I never would have even remotely thought about doing a podcast about comic books or any type of podcast for that reason. Mm -hmm. This was, you know, something that I had no idea what it was when I first got started. And after that first episode, I was like, "Oh my god, I got to keep doing this." I got it. This was absolutely wonderful. I just, you know, absolutely loved it from, you know, go and everything we've done because of this show and just the people we the wonderful people we've gotten to meet some just through voicemail, some just through Internet chats, but some in person has just been something that I'm like, man, this is awesome. And, you know, I'd, I'd love to get out there and meet more people that we talk to every day and just, you know, people who listen to us and who hear us and you know, who like what we got to say or who think I'm an idiot. I'd love to meet you guys <laughs> face to face, you know, just just have a conversation and just see where it goes, because you know, it's something that I'm like, man, this is something I'm very I deeply and truly enjoy and yeah, I'm very passionate about. So thank you, my friend, for everything. And, and to our listening audience out there and, and to our friends that we've made throughout the years on the show, I just want to say thank you. Um, we've been very fortunate that we've had a number of great guests that have come on the show. Um, some have come on as regulars. Some have come on one time. Uh, it, it, you know, Some we've just met at conventions where we've done the, like, quick little commentary and, and interviews or discussions or they've been listeners who we've had on. Uh, Jim mentioned voicemails. Anybody who's, who's taken the time to call into the show with their comments, um, you're, you're greatly appreciated. People who've sent over the years emails, uh, the Facebook group, our previous forum that we did through Comic Geek Speak. Uh, you know, we've, we've had an opportunity to interact with people. There's a silent majority 
of people that listen to the show that, you know, because of the fact that, uh, you know, maybe, maybe when you listen or you live somewhere where it's, it's hard to, you know, do the voicemails or whatever, or you you just, you really just listen to a lot of podcasts and you don't have time to respond to them. Uh, whatever your situation is and your, you know, reasons that we haven't heard from you, you are appreciated. Uh, when we recognize that we have a listening audience, you know, Jim and I could sit around and talk comics to know that there's people out there, whether you listen to every episode or some of them, you know, spot check or, you know, whether you listen to certain segments, uh, it means a lot to know that there's people who find value in some portion of what we do, whether we are your favorite podcast or we fall towards the bottom of it, depending on it. I mean, seriously, the fact that any period, of, and there's a genuine truth to this. If you find value in taking any part of your time and listening to what we do, it's what keeps us coming back to know that there's people who do find that value and find time. You know, I, I look at download numbers, not because I'm trying to compete with anybody else. It's nice to know that people find value in this. Uh, Jim and I put a lot of work into this. You know, it's not just sitting down and recording. It's the preparation for the show. It's the editing of the show. It's, you know, you know, trying to maintain a website and, and trying to, you know, keep a social presence. In the meantime, we're both got full-time jobs and lives like all of you. Um, what keeps us coming back is this is fun, and it's fun because of all of you. So thank you, however you've chosen to digest any of what we do, for uh, taking some time out of your day to uh, make us a part of it. That does mean a lot to us. And, uh, you know, after nine years to know that there's people who still find that, um, it's nice to say that I was just as excited to record this episode today as I was the first episode of the podcast. And, uh, so for those of you that like what we do, that's a good sign that, uh, we will definitely be around for the 10th anniversary yeah. of the show. Cause it's still raging bullets, the musical, right? It's still a lot of, uh, uh we'll really talk about that one. <laughs> 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 well, there might be some prem. <laughs> there might be some way to make that work. <laughs> it, maybe it doesn't sound as stupid as I think. Uh, <laughs> we'll have to talk about the next year. <laughs> it's just dumb enough to make it work. <laughs> but uh, seriously, um, thank you, everybody. Whatever you know, in, involvement you've had in our podcast over the last nine years, whether you're new to the show or you've been around for a long time, uh, thank you so much for making this worth something for us. Now I can get out of here. <laughs> I want to shout out our show voicemail line. It's 1-440-388-4434 or Dr. Norge on Skype. And actually, if there's anything from this episode that you want to comment on, or if you have some of your own thoughts on any of these categories or topics or or what you felt was the best thing pre-convergence in the DC universe, uh, feel free to shout them out. Call into the show and let's, let's get them on. It'd be nice as we're talking about convergence to be uh, kind of celebrating everything that came before. So please, if there's something we missed that was important to you, get it out there and uh, let's let's kind of embrace geeking out. And I encourage you, if you don't do it on our voicemail line, kind of do it over uh, the internet and, and start embracing some things that you loved because uh, the comic book medium can really use a lot of help with people shouting out what they're enjoying and being specific about why. Uh, I think the why is is much more important. It's, it's That's what hooks people into saying, hey, maybe that's for me. So please consider doing that uh, out there. And, and kind of that's that to me is the theme and tone of what we do with Raging Oscars. And if, if somebody walks out after this and says, oh, I want to shout this out, or you guys didn't mention that, I want to get the word out on that. Uh, I, I feel like this is a successful episode if you did that. So please consider doing that. We have a web shite. Web, web <laughs> we have a web Jim, we have a web shite. <laughs> well, we and, got that too. <laughs> right. And after you, you know, go and visit that, you can visit our website, which is ragingbullets.com. Our, that's where you can find out news about what's going on with the podcast. And we do have it linked to our Twitter account. So if you prefer Twitter as far as getting your information, that way you can check that out. Uh, we have a Facebook fan page. We also have a Facebook group, and the Facebook group is really, that's our show forum, and it's uh, so beyond our show, thanks to the quality people that are there. They have taken it far beyond and made it their place, <laughs> where really I'm just a visitor there anymore, and, and I love that. I love that it grew beyond. 
and it's really due to the community of people there. Uh, I'm proud that it's a part of our show on some small level because of that. I love that it grew into something far beyond us, and it's due to the great quality people there. And I want to thank everybody who's been there that posts, shares their thoughts and comments, starts topics up there. I think it's really great to see the positive commentary on pop culture because it it really does cover all of pop culture. If you've never uh, jumped into a Facebook group, I can't recommend this community more because of the great people there. And it really is a testament to them, not us, uh, that uh, it's such a wonderful community to visit. And I just want to thank everybody there. I've mentioned it many times on the show, but it's something that's really important to me. We have pages on Google+. Uh, You can really find us on any social media that you're looking for. I have a PlayStation Network account, so if uh, you're on the PlayStation Network and you don't want to shout me out, feel free to add me. That's also on our Raging Bullets website. You can get a link to that. Uh, we love having everybody a part of the show and, and like interacting with you as much as possible. Once again, shouting out DCBService.com and InStockTrades.com. I want to thank them for supporting our podcast so much over the last nine years. We've been very lucky that we've had some great sponsors. Uh, nobody's stuck with us longer than DCB Service and InStockTrades.com. They've been there. They help offset the cost of doing a podcast. Podcasts aren't free. Um, it is f- very inexpensive to get started on a podcast, but when you start doing one as, as lengthy and as large as ours <laughs> is, uh, there's costs associated with that from the website to the host of the podcast that includes hosting the old files and things like that. Uh, DCBService.com has been there to help offset our costs, and uh, we really appreciate DCB Service and InStockTrades.com, the sister company, for sponsoring our show and having been there so much over the last nine years. They really keep us uh, able to financially do the podcast, and, and we really greatly appreciate that. So please consider um, supporting them, whether you want to support them at DCBService.com or InStockTrades.com. See if you can find some product and some savings for you, and I just want to thank them again for supporting us and so many other podcasts. I don't know how they do it, uh, but they really keep us up and running, and it's uh, thank you for keeping the lights on <laughs> DCBService.com and InStockTrades.com. Jim, our next episode, it's time, Convergence. Convergence is here. We will be talking about Convergence Zero Issue. We will also be talking about, uh, casually, the end of the weekly books. Uh, They're coming to a close as Convergence hits, so we'll be discussing them. Obviously, the meat and potatoes of that is going to be the Convergence event, because that's a pretty big issue, I think, from what I remember if I was reading it properly. But uh, we will be talking also about the end of those weekly books and just having a great time kind of celebrating that the event's here. (laughs) The event that changes everything, because there's going to be huge ramifications to this on the DC Universe. I'm anxious to see what they are and how it's going to play out in the story. That's always the fun part. Our event's here. It's time. So we will see everyone next week. Bye! On November 13th, Sean Whalen was asked to stop constantly talking about comic books. That request came from his wife. Deep down, he knew she was right, but he also knew that someday he would find someone that would talk to him. With nowhere else to go, he appeared at the home of his childhood friend, Jim Segulin. Sometime earlier, Segulin's boss had requested that he shut up about his comic books and never speak of them again. Can two grown men put out a DC Comics podcast without driving each other crazy? It's Raging Bullets, the DC Comics fan podcast. With Sean Whalen as Dr. Norge. And Jim Segulin as the sensei of the whatnot and the Duke of you know. It's a spoiler podcast. So they will go in depth into the plot line, story twists, and whatnot of the comics they are reviewing. So if you haven't read the books, you may want to come back later so you may better enjoy the show.